All right. All in agreement, please show by raising your right hand. Any opposed? All right. Okay. Mr. Smith, I'm going to ask you today if you will give us the Pledge of Allegiance. You'll please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, at this time we will begin uh, with a Goldsboro High School donation. Chairman, Chairman Burden, Dr. Dunsmore, and board members. I'm Margaret Badur, and I've had the pleasure of working on a project to um, install a sound system in Goldsboro High School Auditorium. So just briefly, I wanted to tell you what we've been doing for several months, and it's been pretty exciting. Spring a year ago, a small troop of us local actors went out into the schools to promote literature during Wayne County Reads. When we got to Goldsboro High School, there was a lot of noise in the auditorium, and it became evident that students couldn't hear us. When Ms. Manning said they couldn't hear Jeff Holtz or the loud Margaret Badur, we realized there was a problem. I called my wizard friend, Kim Copeland, the Wayne County Public Schools Director Specialist for the Arts, and she convened a great committee of Sherry Archibald from the Paramount Theater, Goldsboro High School Principal Manning, Assistant Superintendent for Support Services, Dean Sauls, and um, Head Choral Teacher, Jason Cox. We selected the bid from Avalanche Sounds for $10,000. I actually have enjoyed calling on our 22 generous contributors. Almost everyone gave toward our project taking out his, his or a few hers checkbooks right away. And then uh, there were a few uh, donors who, were not, who had not attended Goldsboro High School, but they gave simply because they believe in our schools. I have to recognize my husband, Phil, who is a consummate fundraiser, for giving me advice on this project. The Chamber of Commerce allowed us to deposit the contributions in its Wayne Charitable Foundation. This month, Scott Eli installed the equipment, and as you can see from the photo we're going to pass around, they're going around now? Okay, I've got this great picture of, um, of the faculty of Goldsboro High School, lead choral teacher and um, lead band teacher. And their eyes were glistening when they saw all that sound equipment. I cannot tell you how satisfying it was to um, to see that they were pleased and how, how they were looking so forward to introducing it to their classes in August. How often do you see a problem in the community and say, I wish they'd fix that? Well, it's been a privilege to be able to make a difference in this small way with a sound system that will lead to many programs, plays, orchestras, panel discussions, and will hopefully make the auditorium, once again, a center for activity in our community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Great work. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you so much. much. <laughs> <laughs> Honored to talk. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I've called up here uh, Thank you. Good the stuff. famous <laughs> Kim Cody, <laughs> Thank you. Manning, and uh, Dean Sauls, who are all on the committee. Good job. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. We wish to thank you very much, Mrs. Perdua, and your committee members for the 
our hard work and diligence. And we, I know that we are going to truly enjoy the new sound system. We will know that it is there. Yes. <laughs> you will hear it. Yes, we will hear it. Uh, Dr. Reynolds, at this time, uh, Dr. Reynolds will present an advanced egg stakeholder survey results. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, board members, Dr. Dunsmore. Thank you, first of all, for allowing me the opportunity to give you an overview of the uh, Advanced Ed Stakeholder Survey that was administered back in March of 18, 2018. The purpose of the Climate and Culture Survey uh, basically is to offer the valuable information that can help the schools and to evaluate the environment and measure the perception and the aptitudes for all the stakeholders. We're talking about teachers, support staff, parents, and students. Um, the goal of this survey is to help the decision makers uh, look at and analyze data and to make sure that information makes a positive change in what we are doing in our schools and to make sure that all students have a quality education. Um, the climate and culture surveys are different this year because through research we all know that the climate and the culture makes a big difference in student achievement. So these questions are geared to gauge the climate and the culture of the schools. Okay, the surveys um, will be used as a part of our accreditation process uh, March of 2019, along with um, site reviews. You will have a team that go to different school sites, uh, as well as our Elliott observations, which we've been doing this year. Um, and all of that together will accumulate the actual visit uh, that the team will have. Uh, and they will also use this information when they do reports, annual reports, that uh, gives our information on pre-K through 12th grade uh, educational implications of uh, educational policies and practices. So this is not only just used for our benefit, it's used uh, nationally uh, to assess different things that's happening in the school and to make sure that they research and give feedback on those reports. Uh, just like I said, the team will be here March the 11th through the 13th, uh, consisting of six to eight individuals. These are educators from North Carolina, from other states, uh, that will come together for the purpose of looking at Wayne County Public Schools and determining if we are in fact following those standards that we should be following. It would be in a domain, three domains of leadership, learning, and resources. So those are the areas that they would be looking for. Here you see the respondents. Uh, the different categories, the categories of uh, people that did the survey, as well as the number of respondents. Um, it's, it's a pretty good turnout. Uh, if you see, there's about 10,000 individuals that responded to the survey. This the survey was uh, live for two weeks. You only leave them up for two weeks. Uh, but once they all responded, of course, I um, put the survey down, and then the information was calculated. Uh, the only area that we did not meet um, advanced ed qualifications was parents. We should have at least 20% of our parents respond to the survey. So we're going to do this again in November, around November sometimes. And we're going to focus on trying to make sure that our schools understand that if we have to have a parent night or math night or whatever it is to get parents out to set up a lab, to set up a laptop so they can have those resources right there with them. It is all online. It is in multiple languages. Uh, so it's, it's, it's made very, uh, it makes it easy, but we just got to get the people out. We had plenty of students, staff, uh, elementary students, as well as uh, high school students. If you notice, we do not survey K-2 students. And the research proved that the data and the information we received from students that young didn't really benefit um, and what we were looking for and what advanced aid was looking for. 
So we, we know they're there and we visit and we talk with the babies, but when it comes to surveys, um, they are not included in the survey. Um, now you've had an opportunity to see um, probably all of the data, but what I did was I pulled out some of those questions that, um, that kind of focus and validate on some things that we're doing here in Wayne County. Uh, you're looking at individual learning. This is a teacher uh, inventory, individual learning, student engagement, family engagement, professional development, dealing with data literacy, as well as student within digital learning. Uh, these are all areas that we have actually addressed in our strategic plan and our district plan. And a lot of our schools have used, uh, have also addressed these issues. So when you look at the scores here, we need a lot of help. We, we, got, we need a lot of help, uh, particularly in the individualized learning. Our teachers feel like we're not doing the best job that we can in those areas. Professional development, we're working real closely with our EC department, with our federal funds department, to make sure that we schedule and plan and implement professional development for our teachers addressing these particular areas. Um, also, the Elliott walkthrough tool that we used this year uh, validates that our digital learning is very low. It's actually 1.69 on a scale of four. Okay. So our teachers feel like we are not using what we have. So we've got to do some things to make sure that they have the training to use those um, devices. Uh, this is a, a new survey. In the past, we have not surveyed support staff. Uh, Advanced Ed thought it was very important that we get feedback from our support staff, <coughs> uh, instructional assistants, uh, clerical staff. How do they feel? What are some things that we need to look at and address with them? Um, particularly the area of uh, their responsibilities. How do they feel with their responsibilities? And if you can see here, uh, the different categories uh, are fairly low. So we, we do need to pay attention to our support staff. Uh, and we need to look at what they're saying and make sure that we are treating them as professionals as they are. So that was a very interesting um, survey. <coughs> Here's student survey. Uh, the student surveys, uh, when you look at expectations and you're looking at what students are expected to do in the class and what they feel like they're expected to do, it makes a difference here. And if you see the scores here, they say they're learning, but then you look at all of the other areas. Are they really understanding what they're doing? Okay, how does the teachers feel? How do the teachers treat you? Uh, so that plays a big part in how the students behave in class. So if they feel like a teacher care, or they're concerned, then the students will most likely, uh, you know, won't have behavior issues and problems. So those are some things that we need to look at with our students in their interaction, they're respectful. So the survey for students actually have, you can probably, it's about total 15 to 16 questions. And you can look at the whole report if you'd like to see it. I do have copies of that I can share with you. Okay, this is the parent survey. Uh, this particular survey, what caught my attention were areas uh, for the question, for example, the things that, that they think their students are doing in class, uh, working with others with 59%, but look at the completing of worksheets. Parents think that our students are sitting in class filling out worksheets. Uh, so that's a concern to me. Um, so we've got to work on that. And also testing. We know that sometimes we can't control the testing piece, but these are the perceptions that the parents have within the classroom. The part about respectful, supportive, and helpful uh, have room for improvement. We definitely need to look at that. But our parent surveys and bringing parents involved and getting them involved in the child's educational process is very, very important. Um, and we've got to look at that. And we've actually looked at some engaging um, initiatives uh, that we've got going on. I know, for example, we have uh, other positions that the Title I uh, coordinator is trying to work with us to get parents engaged, to get students engaged. 
Uh, they're looking at bringing on um, extra support staff to help educate parents uh, with students that are not even in school yet. So those types of things uh, uh, that we're looking at. So what does it say? What does this survey say? It was not a surprise. The issues and the things that showed up on this survey, first of all, was uh, looking at our instructions, revising our instructions, looking at data, um, teaching teachers how to use the data and how to come up with, uh, with the strategies, improving the culture, getting our parents and students involved, uh, also increasing the rigor in our classrooms, making sure that our teachers understand how to differentiate between uh, lessons and students and making sure that their needs are met, and also the digital teaching and learning are big parts of what we saw on this survey, which is also those things that we know on our, on our plans that we have to address. So basically, the survey confirmed and validated those areas of need that we know are there. Um, and when the advanced ed team comes into uh, Wayne County, they're going to look at the results. They're going to look at our plans. They're going to look at our uh, strategic plan that we have each individual school and kind of look at our student achievement data and kind of look at where we are. They realize it's a continuous improving process. They don't expect them to come in here and determine, to let you know that everything's perfect because it's not. But it's a journey. It's a process. And it's something that we have to constantly, constantly work on in trying to improve for the students here in Wayne County. Um, are there any questions about the survey? I do. I have a question. Um, I have two questions. Um, first of all, about a year ago, um, Dr. Artis gave us a presentation. Um, and I posed some questions about digital learning at that particular time about, um, about teachers having the knowledge to be able to use that tool um, and were we adequately training them. Um, you gave a figure a while ago of 1.6% with digital learning. Can you go back and, and discuss that a little bit? Are you saying that the, the students are only 1.6% of the students are learning from that or only 1.6% <coughs> of the teachers are using it or, okay. or what? That, uh, that comes from the Elliott tool. And when you go into the classroom, you go through and you actually select what you see and don't see. Okay. That is selected when you see students using digital devices. Okay, so that's, that's not reflective as to whether the teachers know how to use it or the students know no. how to use it and are using it. It's just what you observed when you were in there, correct? Yes, sir. That tool is looking directly at students. Okay, because my, question, my question a year ago to Ms. Artis was, <coughs> um, was, are we adequately spending the dollars on digital learning, even though we've got different programs in different schools? and doing the proper training with the teachers to be able to use that. that. But you, you've just explained, you've told me that 1.6% uh, were actually using it when you were in there. It's the children. Okay. 1.6% okay. of the kids, At the students, time you were in there. At the time that we're at in the there. Time and you were and in we're there. talking about okay. 15, 1,800 different So different realistically, entries. we could have 85% then. Yeah. As far as Basically, okay. the tools are there and the teachers may be using them, but the All students' right. hands are not on them. Okay, let's go to the survey then. Okay, you mentioned that parents, um, and I have to understand that it was parents who actually did the survey. Okay, and you had X number of parents that volunteered to do the survey when you could have had a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. But out of the ones that did answered the survey, only 55% of them felt like they were being, they, the information they were getting from the teachers in the school was helpful yes. in their communication. 55%. What, what were the primary concerns that they had that they did not feel like? Where, where the, what was the other 45%? What, what was, what were they saying was not helpful and what did they ask for as far as change went in the survey? This particular survey didn't, or did it allow it? This survey didn't allow that. Now, what we can do, uh, 
which is, which is a change, is when we build these surveys, we can add in questions to get further feedback. And I think whenever we do it in November, I'll develop, you know, we'll develop the questions, but if we want to get further input from what we see here, we can add in questions, additional questions. Well, I feel questions. like we need to because yes, that's, that's a moot point of mm -hmm. asking somebody are they helpful or not if they're not going to tell you how you can improve. Yes, we can tailor those questions based on what we see on this survey to get more feedback. Okay. Dr. Reynolds, I would like to ask if you would give each board member a copy of the survey questions because that might even help us more explain some of the answers. <coughs> and see where, I yeah. sure will. I will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How we got here, what specifically were they asked to, for them to say that okay. 55 of them feel that their interactions with the staff is beneficial or helpful? Mm -hmm. We'll do that. Yes. Mr. Smith? Uh, Dr. Reynolds, uh, kind of piggybacking on a question that Mr. Bridget asked regarding the respondents. Uh, what uh, what was your response rate? I mean, what percentage of respondents does this represent, this 10,316, out of the total population that you were targeting? Okay. Do you have that well, number? Well, each individual section, like, for example, the staff, 60% of the staff is a sufficient number. Uh, when it comes to parents, we're looking at the number of students we have and they're looking at the percentage, 20% of that should be the response, which is 38, 3,800 parents responding, and you see we only have 1828. Right. Okay. So you have less than 50%. Less than 50%. Mm -hmm. So. So, but, but would, you, would you say that the data, even though you did not have the higher response rate, the data would be uh, statistically significant? Pretty as much. As it relates to the outcome? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. On the Elliot that you were talking about, the 1.6 with the, that's a 1.6 out of 4. Out of 4. So the Elliot is scored 1, 2, 3, 4. Oh, okay. A rubric. Yeah. It's a it's rubric. I'm sorry. I should yeah. explain that. Okay. It's a rubric of 1 to 4. And I we was score. thinking 1.6% of 100. Okay. 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 Yeah. okay. Any other comments or questions? Do Dr. Reynolds, I have a question. Um, it was interesting, the 44% um, that folks thought that, <clears throat> the, the comment that, that they spent 44% of them, um, uh, as I understand your graph here, felt like that they spent most of their time taking tests. Um, now, and you, um, as we both know, there's so many tests that are mandated. Uh, but are the tests mandated on the state level or the federal level? I would imagine parents talking about any test state. They're probably talking about tests that the kids take in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I, so, I would imagine they're talking about any test when the kids come home and they talk about they have to take tests. Well, I mean, I hear that all the time. I've heard Ms. Strickland make comments about testing is so laborious. And um, when I was a student in school, I was one of those that didn't test well. <laughs> Uh, but obviously I was not a failure. Um, is there anything we can do about that concept? I mean, this is the perception of the parent. This is how they feel. I mean, I, testing, I, I, we, I mean, we're mandated to do tests. I, I, under, I understand that that's the perception of the parent. Um, I guess what I'm trying to determine from you is exactly what the facts are. Um, and the facts are, do you feel like that there's too much testing? I have no opinion. I know we have to, we are mandated to do tests. We have EOCs, EOGs. I, I hear that term all the time. We're and mandated. Uh, who, who mandates us to do it? It's by the state. Federal it's mandated state. by the state and the federal government. Okay. That we take well, that's what I said. I asked you this state and federal government. Yes, sir. Is a primary mandate. So uh, the reason I'm saying this is that all those parents out there that feel like there's too much testing, you need to take it to your state representatives. Would anybody disagree with that? If it's mandated by the state. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Reynolds, don't go to <laughs> <laughs> Looking at your teacher inventory uh, and your graph there, 
where we're talking about um, less learning goals are different for each student in my class. We, we've got some very low numbers of 39%. That seems to signify to me that there is not a uh, individualized type of learning culture. Uh, would you agree with that statement? Well, from, from the 39%, um, that's what it looks like. Okay. <coughs> yes, sir. And also looking at that, uh, lessons include opportunity for students to be creative and engaged. Again, another 39%. So this leads me to the question, how can we improve those particular numbers? What we're looking at, we have to work with our teachers in our classroom, make sure that they are trained in their classroom how to uh, educate students at different levels, different learning styles, and as well as getting students involved. We know students that are engaged, involved, active in the classroom learn better by doing. So our focus is to train our teachers, provide them with targeted professional development specific for these areas. Okay, and a, another area of concern for me seems to be in the area of behavioral issues and discipline. Uh, many, many of the schools that I have visited, ha that has been a major concern. Do you think that that also may impact these numbers as well? I'm sure it do. The, uh, yes, sir, I'm sure it do. So, and what are we doing try to address that particular component of it? Because it appears that we are having a larger number of discipline problems in some of our schools. Are we doing any kind of focused intervention for particular schools where we see that behavioral issues or discipline <laughs> issues are a problem? Uh, we are doing different things at the schools. Uh, first of all, it's like I said, providing um, staff development for teachers that have classroom management issues, but particularly working with uh, the staff, the principals. Uh, we, I know in C and I department, we focus on the, on the curriculum, but I do know behavior plays a big part of how a child learn and achieve. So all of that. So the, the, this may lead us to look at what type of resources are actually in the individual schools and are all the needed resources there and available to those students. Would you agree? Yes, sir. Uh, second of all, I believe last year, uh, when I first came on the board, one of the things I was very concerned about was how our teachers are using data and how they are interpreting data. And from this teaching inventory, that shows me that we still have a long way to go with, uh, with that element. For our future, for the upcoming year, have we made any plans to kind of address the interpretation and the use of data with all of our teachers? Yes, sir. That's actually ongoing. If, if you look at our district plan and our strategic plan, it particularly tells you that we're providing uh, PD, are we looking at making sure that teachers have PD on interpreting data? That's one of the things that uh, on our last advanced ed visit, they saw all of this data, but they didn't see how it was actually getting down to the classroom. How is a teacher using this data to change and modify their lessons? So that is an ongoing process here in Wayne County is making sure that we provide our teachers with some PD professional development. Uh, you know, different things come up, but our goal is to, is to educate our teachers in determining and interpreting data and then making a difference in their classroom. Okay. Uh, again, I'm, and I'm just going to ask for your opinion. I, I know it's not, you probably won't have any factual information that you can ri rely on or pull, but what uh, would you say uh, relative to our beginning teachers and our, uh, our um, first year teachers, how do they rate as it compares to those, these three items that I've mentioned, the learning goal, individualized training, the uh, and creative, uh, creative engagement with our students as well as our interpretation and use of data? Well, we have an excellent um, BT program, mentors. Uh, through our HUR department, and they are making sure that from day one that those beginning teachers are in sessions, talking with mentors, are paired up with individuals in those schools that's going to help them and support them. 
So we do know that it's very important that beginner teachers have that training. But we've got an excellent BT training program here in Wayne County. And how do you determine from the training that they've been provided by HR that it is actually being effective? Well, we're hoping in the schools, along with the principals, along with the uh, staff and assistant principals, that they are also monitoring and assisting and helping the new teachers. But when you see numbers like 39% and 44%, would that raise the issue to you whether or not it's being effective? I think across the board we probably need PD across the board, but yes, sir, our goal is to make sure our new teachers receive all of the help and assistance that they can as new teachers. It's, it's, it's testing, but I think we have people in place to assist them. And, and I know I keep hearing you mention professional development. One of the concerns I have about professional development is that I have attended several professional development type of training programs, and those training programs from my perspective, and I can only speak for me, I can't speak for the teachers, the parents, or anybody else, but a lot of times those professional development programs are more feel-good kind of programs that might motivate that, that uh, teacher or that parent while they're in that session, but the transference of what they are learning in that session, sometimes I don't, I don't know if it's really taking place. So that's one of the things I'm, I'm very much concerned about. Well, one thing we, we ask after professional development session is feedback. We have surveys and we have feedback. Let us know how, how did this help you? How are you going to use it in the future? Now, that's one of the requirements that we do in C and I department. Every time we have a professional development session is to gather feedback. Okay, and oftentimes feedback is very subjective and not objective, yeah, right? Could be. Could be. So that, uh, that's one of the elements, I think, that comes along with interpreting data, mm -hmm. is to determine how much of this is being very subjective versus how much of it is objective data that I can take and use to modify whatever is going on. But, and, and, I, and I'm not throwing a finger at you. What I want to know is what, as a board, can this board do to improve these numbers for us? Support the staff, support C and I, support the principals, assistant principals, as we go in and, and provide these, uh, these trainings. We need the support so we can do the, the best we can for the teachers and for the students. And can you specifically tell me a little bit more about what you mean by support? I mean, if something is going on, and let's say, for example, if someone comes to you and they say something is going on, you know, let us know so we can go in and fix it or work with it. Just support us and trust that we're going to do, hopefully, what we should be doing for the teachers and for the students. Sure. I think the board made some moves tonight and is making some moves tonight that are going to be very supportive for us. You think they are? I believe so. Hey, we'll discuss that after the meeting, then, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I, but, but Dr. Reynolds, I do want to thank you for this advanced answer, uh, presentation. I think it's very critical for this board to be very familiar with what this advanced ed certification is going to look like and very knowledgeable so that as we are interviewed possibly by some of these uh, the, the surveyors, so to speak, that we will, have, we will be able to respond to some of their concerns with a knowledge, with a knowledge base, but I, I I do want to also say that the um, the surveys and I've looked at all of them: the teachers, the parents, the support staff, the entire document. Overall, I think it's an outstanding document, and it does lead to show us that we are doing some good things in Wayne County. Thank you. Thank you. Don't leave yet. It's my turn. <laughs> I'm sorry. I promise to keep it short, though. Um, are we showing the student surveys to the teachers and the staff? Yes. The okay. results? Yes. Here. Yes. Outstanding. Because the one thing that, I, there was two things that actually piqued my interest. And um, obviously everybody thinks that they're doing an awesome job. So 71% of our students say that they are having um, respectful interactions with their teachers. But only 54th feel that their teachers are honest. And that's a, a huge concern to me because you have to buy into your teacher and what they're teaching you. 
Um, and then the other thing that I did have great concern in, and I would like to be able to tease out the numbers of the three through fifth grade mm -hmm. versus the upper grades with the am I expected to be good at something? Mm -hmm. Because I think that's really gonna hit on some other issues that may lo roll into their learning as well and some of uh, the other things that have been presented. So those were my only thoughts and questions for later when I kind of dig through the questions. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Reynolds. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move now to our individual or group who wish to appear before the board. Mr. Smith. Okay. <clears throat> the Wayne County Board of Education requests to appear before the board. The Wayne County Board of Education welcomes the opportunity to hear from the public during its regularly scheduled meetings. If you wish to appear before the board, please review the following procedures. Appearance request forms are available to the public at the reception desk in the lobby 30 minutes prior to the meeting. Anyone wishing to speak must place their appearance request form along with any handouts in the basket located at the receptionist's desk in the lobby. The basket will co be collected at 5 p.m. and only those who have an appearance request form in the basket will be allowed to speak. Public comments are scheduled to take place at 5.30 p.m. Presentations are limited to a maximum of three minutes. The chairman, chairperson, shall call time on any presentation which exceeds the three-minute time limit. Organizations or groups wishing to speak about a particular topic may be asked to reduce the time of each individual or to use a spokesperson to share comments on behalf of their organization or group. Substitute speakers will not be permitted and speakers may not donate any portion of their time to another speaker. No presentation shall include any complaint, criticism, or negative comments regarding the conduct or performance of identified school personnel. No presentation shall include information about a particular student which is privileged and confidential under state and federal privacy laws. Now there's a handout for this first one, so go this way and this way. The first um, comment will come from Mr. Barry Merrill. Um, he's representing the Southern Wayne High School and his topic is Southern Wayne High School Classroom, Gyms, and Teacher Bonus. Wayne County has a history of, of uh, promising new facilities south of river. But for years, money has run out before it gets there. 18 years ago, Southern Wayne uh, was told they would have to uh, wait to get a new gym like CBA and Rosewood. Uh, it, was not no, it was not surprising when this board came up with a, a facility plan for the county commissioners five years ago. Uh, and yet again, there was no money in the, in the uh, foreseeable future for a gym for, for uh, Southern Wayne. CPA and Rosewood had theirs, and, and we have other more important priorities. Well, thanks to our county commissioner uh, from Southern Wayne, we have the money for a new gym. It was, not, it was not surprising to many in Southern Wayne that, uh, that when county commissioners and school board members uh, will agree that students in Northern Wayne uh, should not have to uh, be put in uh, mobile classrooms, when it came to the uh, recommended replacement of 30-year-old uh, temporary mobile classrooms at Southern Wayne and giving Southern Wayne the quality of athletic facilities that CBA and Rosewood have, we don't have enough money. We in Southern Wayne uh, found the extra money that was needed. Please don't tell us again that we don't have the votes to get what is right. What, it, what has been promised, you are a good, you are good people who want to do the right thing mm -hmm. for all students in our county. For too long, we have uh, denied some of the resources and facilities uh, they need, uh, some students need to succeed. We will continue to be a poor county 
and a poor county school system if we uh, continue to act like one. Grabbing and, and scratching for, for uh, uh, only for our own. There is a there is proposal to offer bonuses to make sure we, we get the staff we need to bring up our low performing elementary schools. We've seen, uh, we've seen some success with that approach and I understand that we have the money to do it. I ask your support not, uh, I ask your support not just for Southern Wayne kids, but for students uh, in every school who, um, who are being left behind. Can we afford to lose another generation? Thank you for uh, representing my grandkids and caring for, the, for, for their education. Thank you very much, sir. Next, we have Mr. Sean Hicks. He's representing himself, and his topic is public school drop-off times. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, as far as the school drop-off times, um, I would like the board to consider uh, drop-off times, especially at the elementary school level. Um, for instance, with uh, my son attends Fremont Elementary School and the current time has been changed to 10 after 8. Um, the time starts to, as far as getting later for the elementary school kids, you start to impose on employment situations for us as parents. Um, I have to be back in Goldsboro by <coughs> 830 um, to be to my employer. Um, my wife has to be at work by 7 a.m., um, so I am responsible for dropping off our three children um, in the mornings, one at daycare, uh, one starting school this year, which may end up going to a separate school. Um, but it, it starts to impose on employment situations. Um, using my example, but I'm sure there are other parents that are in the same situation, um, but I just want you to consider the earlier drop-off times, especially for the younger children. Um, I'm not going to leave my child at home to attempt to catch a bus on their own. Um, and I don't have a situation where I have other people in my life that I can trust or count on to be able to do my responsibilities as a parent. Um, thank you for your time and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, next we have Mr. Granger, Ray Martin Sr., uh, representing Carver High School, High, Carver High School Alumni and Friends Association, and his subtopic is introduction as the 2018-2020 new National Board President. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. It's a pleasure to get a chance to meet you. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to stop by and introduce myself. I am running unopposed as the new National Board President for the Carver Alumni and Association, Alumni and Friends Association. And um, I just wanted to acknowledge that in the past we've had uh, Lynn Henderson as a uh, guest speaker on, uh, on one occasion. And we're looking forward to having uh, Raymond Smith this coming Thursday to address our scholarship program. This year we're giving out 10 $2,500 scholarships uh, and that's the most that we've ever given and that's partly due to the class of 1967 which not bragging but I'm a part of that class. <laughs> uh, we contributed $10,000 last year to the coffers uh, so we're able to do that. Um, for those of you that may not uh, be aware of that program it's at 6 o'clock um, at the Carver Cultural uh, banquet hall there on the, uh, the old Carver campus and uh, uh, it's open to the public so you're welcome to come. Also I would like to note that on October the 13th at 3 p.m. Uh, we have formed a uh, uh, historical committee and they're making a formal presentation of the history of Carver that dates back to 1880. Uh, so um, 
you will probably be getting a formal invitation, but uh, just save the date as of now. And uh, the last thing I would like to say, we as the, uh, or as the incoming, right now I serve as the vice president of the national board, but as the incoming national board president, I just want to find out from you what we can do as alumni to help with the educational process. One of the targets, I shared this with Mr. Henderson, that we're focused on is the uh, students at risk. Uh, and at the Mount Island Middle School, we, I, I, I was told that there's 44 students there. And so we have the principal, Ms. Nelson, that's going to address us in August, and we're going to try to formulate something. But we have also approached uh, Mr. Smith at Southern Wayne High School, and we've been to the Brogdon Middle School and the uh, Grantham Middle School to, to let them know that we want to focus on students at risk. But we'd need for you to tell us if there's anything else that we can do to make life a little bit more exciting and bearable for, uh, for the students that, particular students at risk. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, since you're unopposed, I will take this opportunity to say congratulations <laughs> on your new assignment. <laughs> We're going to go to board spots. At this time, because um, we have five minutes before 6 p.m., I think we need to go ahead on and, com and, and go to our board spotlight. Madam Chair, thank you. And before I do board spotlight, I have asked uh, our board chair if I could have a few minutes of personal privilege to speak on uh, speak regarding our board spotlight. I have known the family uh, for a, a long time. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the grandfather of our board spotlight is my second cousin. I didn't want the board to know that because they probably would have turned it down if I <laughs> said anything about it. But I. Uh, Brandon Lark Jr. is a very special young man, very special, very special to me. Um, he has been um, very, very instrumental in things that go on at Brogdon Primary School, and sometimes I even tell Ms. Wynn from the activities and, and things that I have attended at Brogdon Primary School, I sometimes wonder who's in charge, Ms. Wynn or Mr. Lark, because he's <laughs> always there. He's been a very very active individual in the school and to see him uh, interact in that school and to show the m amount of love and support that he has not only for the students but for the teachers and the principal as well sh tells me a whole lot about our students in the southern part of the county. Oftentimes when we look at the southern part of the county the things that are being said is oh they're low performing schools. Yes, we are low-performing schools at Brogdon Primary, Brogdon Middle. At the present time, we are. But with the attributes of, the, of Mr. Uh, uh, Brandon B.J. Lark, Jr., we see that not every child is a low-performing child. Mm -hmm. So we need to dispel the rumor of thinking that everybody that attends a low-performing school is a low-performing individual, because that is not the case. Uh, I am pl particularly pleased with the, the um, uh, what's the word I want to use, the goals and the things that Mr. B.J. has done. Uh, I knew his grandmother. His grandmother passed last October, I think it was this past, October the 12th. And she was a very instrumental person in B.J.'s life. She, from what I can tell, she has instilled in him, not only she, but his parents as well, have instilled in him that number one virtue, and that is to love thy neighbor as thyself. And, it, and that's the reason why uh, we are honoring this board spotlight tonight. Because for a nine-year-old who is in the fourth grade to not think of himself 
but to think of others is something that is rare. It's uncommon. And it's something that we as a board, as a community, as a state need to begin to recognize because all too often we hear of all the negative things that go on in our society. And we fail to recognize the good things that are going on. So I made a personal plea to uh, the board chairman. I, I said, please, whatever you do, let me allow me an opportunity to nominate this individual for our board spotlight for this year. And our board spotlight is no one other than Brandon B.J. Lark. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask Brandon B.J. Lark and his family, Mother Rashina, Father Brandon Sr., Grandfather Anthony Wynn, and any others who would like to stand with him as I present this award to him to please come forward. Oh yeah, I forgot Miss Miss Wynn and also Miss Kennan and my and I think that's his grandmother other grandmother right back here. And he also has some church members. If y'all are coming to stand straight up here, just yeah, won't you come back here? Okay. <laughs> Mr. Lark is a rising fourth grader at Brogdon Primary. We are recognizing this young man for his special achievements of raising over $1,900 for his school. And let me say that BJ, when he initially started this plan, he only had a goal of raising $250. Once he raised that, he said, Mama, I can't stop now. <laughs> he then set another goal of $500. That goal had been <laughs> surpassed. He, raised, he set his goal at $1,000. And as, you, as I already told you, he has surpassed that goal as well. And his goal <laughs> is to raise now $5,000 for our Wayne County teachers. It is important to note that th his contribution was born not out of any school or community-led fundraising. He has raised his money all on his own. His fundraiser was born out of the simple idea that he could help ease the burdens for teachers who were dipping into their own pockets just for classroom supplies. In recent weeks, Mr. Lark has applied a philanthropic and entrepreneurial spirit to raising funds for his school. In addition to getting one of his parents to launch an online fundraising page, he began selling lemonade and Beanie Babies. And amazingly, Mr. Lark, BJ, was able to secure a donation of over 2,000 licensed TY Beanie Babies to be used for his fundraiser. 100% of his donations and his sales will go directly to teachers to purchase their classroom supplies. Interestingly, Mr. Lark's original goal was raised to just raise a few hundred dollars for his school. However, since he launched his campaign, community support has helped him surpass all of his initial goals and he is now working to raise $5,000, and it is in hopes to expand his efforts, not only for Brogdon Primary School, but for his sister school, Brogdon Middle School as well. So Mr. Lark BJ, on behalf of the board, we thank you for all your efforts to support the Brogdon area teachers, and we commend you for the character you have demonstrated throughout this fundraiser. And today, <laughs> we'd like to recognize that it is particularly a great deal that the Wayne County Board of Education recognizes Brandon Lark Jr. for raising over, it says $1,200, but we know you raise more than that money, <laughs> to assist teachers in purchasing their classroom supplies, given this day, June the 27, 2018. 
I do not have it signed by our chair yet, but I'm going to have that done before you leave out here, okay? So I, again, would like to applaud the principal for instilling uh, respect. I'd like to, more importantly, also recognize his mother, Regina Clark, and his father, Brandon Clark, and his grandmother and grandfather for all of their support. For without their support, none of this would be evident. So thank you, Brandon. And I want to see more of us, all of you, 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 and before we do that, Regina, I would like for you to come up here and let them know what, what, what is the GoFundMe page so that any, anybody that might be here today might be also willing to contribute. Hello, everyone. Um, the GoFundMe page is actually Teacher School Supply Drive, and you just click, you go to the GoFundMe.com and just enter Teacher School Supply Drive, and you'll see Brandon with his Beanie Babies. And um, we're actually having a uh, Beanie Baby sale this Friday at 5 o'clock, 5 to 8 p.m. We um, offer free lemonade, water, and he also gives everybody a friendship bracelet because he says he's making friends along the way. So um, hopefully we'll see some of you Friday from 5 to 8 p.m. at 109 Glenwood Trail, Goldsboro. Thank you. Thank you. And if you can't make it there, you can go to the GoFundMe page. <laughs> All right, Brandon, if you would, come around. <laughs> Very proud of you, sir. That was an amazing job. Nice job. Good job. That's amazing. I know y'all are proud. That's incredible. How are you? Y'all are doing a good job. Congratulations. Yes, they find young man. Thanks for coming today. Congratulations. Amazing young man. Congratulations. I know you're proud. Congratulations. You don't usually see these kind of awards this young. This is amazing. Congratulations. Congratulations, you guys. Y'all take them out to dinner now. Congratulations. Exactly. Brandon, is that your address? Your so if I send you a donation, you would get it, do you? Okay, I don't like GoFundMe. <laughs> <laughs> they get more straight from you. GoFundMe takes, GoFundMe takes a percent, so it's better oh. to send them a check. Okay. I mean, not that we don't want it. Yes. At this time, we will have a facilities update. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Dunsmore. Thank you for the opportunity to update you on some facility uh, items that have gone through our committee. Um, at your desk, you should have an orange folder. I'd love to start out, uh, excuse me, with an update on Southern Wayne High School in Northwest. I apologize for these uh, documents not being in board docs. I wasn't able to meet the deadline, so that's my fault there, but thank you for this opportunity. What you have um, in your folder as we're moving through the process of uh, preparing to bid out Southern Wayne High School and Northwest Elementary School Edition, you have a new floor plan for the gymnasium. I actually just received this yesterday, so our facilities committee has not had the opportunity to look at it yet. But this is a more detailed floor plan of the gymnasium, so you can see the locker installations, uh, the bathrooms, as well as the training rooms and the um, locker room area for the referees and officials. So I wanted to share that with you. Uh, I also wanted to share a couple pages. The next page, which looks a little uh, more crude, that's actually a drawing that the civil architect has done as I met with him on site at Southern Wayne High School. And what you'll see there is if you'll flip it where the proposed gym site is located, the red line, the reason I wanted to share that with you is right now we're in the process of having the civil site survey done at both Southern Wayne High School 
and at both Northwest Elementary School. The civil site survey, as you're probably aware, has to be done to locate our stormwater drains, our sewage, our electrical, any utilities that we may have. So that will be done inside that red line. So we have a very large area that will be surveyed before we actually physically place the gymnasium where it's going to be on site. Um, that's very, very important because obviously we'll also do calculations on how much area of the gym as well as the classroom additions will cover at um, Northwest as well as Southern Wayne because we have to calculate for stormwater run runoff and things like that. Um, our timeline currently for this and looking at bid is we are pushing very hard to have this go to bid by the end of July. That is our goal. We have two survey crews uh, going one for Southern Wayne High School and one for Northwest to make that happen as quickly as we can on that. Um, also, I have spoken with Mr. Uh, Rayner, the owner of Triangle Timber East, just to let you know he and I have talked almost regularly about this process. Um, this site survey has to have a topographical map done to actually look at the elevations of the site to determine what grading will have to be done once our addition go into both locations. So he, uh, before the timber comes out, so it doesn't make it a little messy to get this done, we're having someone come in, clear the underbrush so the uh, land is not disturbed, for lack of better words, before the trees are taken out. Mr. Rayner has ensured me uh, that he'll get that out. If not, if we push a little late, he will come and cut out the section where the gym will sit to make sure that is out. Uh, he did do as we ask in facilities. Uh, he has included an overcut in the contract. Uh, and I have seen that contract. It has been given to me, and I have asked for um, one edit as a sentence was duplicated and, re and returned that back to uh, his representative. And when I get that, I will refer it to our board attorney for um, legal approval with that. So if you have any questions about Southern Wayne before I move to the next item or Northwest, I'm happy to answer those at this time. Dr. Harrell, um, is Mr. Rayner, um, will, will he be able to get the timber out before you do the topo? No, sir, because what we had, a mm. as we're trying to rush it so fast right. to get this done uh, and have this put to bid by the end of July, the concern was, was that if Mr. Rayner began, it would hinder our surveyor from getting in that location. So we're going to have the topo and the, and the civil survey done first. And just as yeah. soon as that out, Mr. Rayner has instructed me to please let him know so he can prepare to get that out. Well, I've done quite a bit of that kind of work, and the topo is actually a lot easier to do with the timber removed because the timber is not restricting it. So, but um, we don't want to hold the project. Up, no. so. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, one of the concerns from the site surveyor was yeah. that if, when the timber process started and how close right. we are on the window, right. as well as there may right. be you know some debris or tops left, that it might make it harder for him to get through the uh, area. <coughs> okay. Yes, sir. Other questions before I move to the next item? Okay, you have Northwest as well. I just want to make sure you'll see Northwest with those. And inside, again, the red area there, the very last sheet, is where we'll be doing the civil survey. Northwest will be a little easier as we do not have any standing timber on site to work through there. We will have to potentially look at moving and relocating some stormwater drains. Um, on the, if you're familiar with that campus, potentially where the ball fields are located. It will be at the top of your sheet. And we also will have to look at relocating the driveway that as you enter the campus on the uh, bottom right side as the proposed additions will go through that area. So again, once we have this uh, site survey prepared, I will bring that back to facilities so they can have a look at that. But again, our goal for these projects, Southern Wayne first, as we're trying to prioritize there while we're working as well with Northwest to get that done. So I wanted you to be aware of where we are in case you have any questions from anyone. If you have no questions there, I'll move to my next update item. Just wanted to make all of you aware that the last uh, board meeting, uh, thank you for approving uh, us being able to take the air conditions out of the mobile units at the mobiles that are at Spring Creek High School and move those to the um, ag shop as well as the automotive shop at Charles Baycock High School. We went out, maintenance turned the electrical on to those units to check those. Unfortunately, both of the units in the mobile that we were going to move, there's two mobiles, two of the uh, air conditioning units were non-operative. They've been sitting so long. One was still operative, but the concern is since it's so old, we may not be able to get parts. So I am going to get uh, quotes and bids on the potential of putting in new units in the um, FFA shop, agriculture shop, as well as automotive shop. So I wanted you to know that, and I'll bring that to facilities when I have those. 
Um, also, Eastern Wayne High School bleachers, to let you know there, we have had the legal review of the contract for that. Um, the bleachers have been removed from Eastern Wayne High School, and it looks really good. I've contacted maintenance about painting the walls while the bleachers are out, and the installation of that is scheduled between August 1st and August 13th for our new bleachers. Those bleachers have been ordered, and as you're probably aware, they have to be specially made depending on the gym and have those put in. They'll arrive sometime August 1st in boxes and will be staged on the floor in the gym and then assembled there. I want you to be aware of that as we're moving forward. Also, tennis courts had a question about that. I have been contacted uh, or contacted court one um, per legal review and advice from our attorney looking at the general contractor conditions they sent to me. There's a clause in there about arbitration and as I was advised, our legal representation, that is something that since we're a government entity uh, would not be in good faith. So I've asked them to remove that clause to get that back to me and I've also sent with them our general conditions contract to have them sign it and as soon as that is signed I will work with them to schedule a time to have our courts at Charles Baycock and Rosewood High School repaired as soon as possible because I know that our, our uh, fall sports seasons are upon us. I want to make you aware of one last item uh, at Eastern Wayne High School. Uh, we had some moisture damage that happened to the basketball court at Eastern Wayne High School. This, I believe, happened about five years ago as well, and the gym floor was repaired. Uh, what we had was the drain pan in the air conditioned units in the roof of the facility. The gym was built somewhere in 76, 77, so the air conditioned units are in the roof. The drain pan overflowed, the condensation ran down into the ductwork, and then cascaded onto the floor. If you're familiar with the floor at Eastern Wayne High School, it's what's called a bulldog lock system. The floor is installed in concrete. It's not a floating floor. It's the same kind of floor we have at Spring Creek High School. So the floor is actually pinned in between the concrete and not allowed to float. So the water has gotten underneath the floor. And I've had two <coughs> people look at it so far. I've got three more. I've got one coming tomorrow and I have one coming Friday that we're going to meet to look at the potential repair of the floor. I have a concern right now that the floor is not safe uh, around center court for volleyball season. Uh, one of the vendors that looked at it uh, recommended that we go ahead and have maintenance potentially remove the spot that um, has buckled or come up. It has about 21% moisture in it right now, which is way too high for wood. And the moisture's trapped on top of the concrete underneath the floor. So I might look and talk to maintenance and get some direction from our facilities committee on having us go ahead and remove that spot because the concern is as we move through our process of getting quotes and bids and then getting it approved that the moisture damage may increase. And by the time a quote is done, when they come, there might be more that needs to be taken out than what was quoted at the time, if that makes sense. So I want to make you aware of that situation each one high school. The air conditioning units, I've been assured, have been uh, fixed. We have now have a float system installed in the drain pan, so when the water level increases, it should turn off the unit and not happen. Because this will be the second time, I think, in five years that it's happened. May I so, ask a question, please? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we are able to, to uh, repair that area without damage to the entire floor? Yes, ma'am. So what will have to happen, uh, Madam Chair, is we'll, the location itself is a a little below center court on the, um, not the, the side that the um, teams would <coughs> sit, the side that's more spectators would sit in the cheerleaders. So we can take that section out. The, the issue we have with this floor is this floor, it's a very good system. It is, it's one of the better systems you can have keeping it dry and moisture away from it. So as the water has <coughs> gotten underneath it and has caused it to um, buckle mm -hmm. or to uh, convex, it's actually coming up that the boards are bowing themselves. It was repaired five years ago. What they have to do is it has rails on the concrete that the wood is attached to, where a traditional floor might have a wood subfloor that you would, just like your house, you would attach the, the uh, wood to. So they had to take that area up, cut off the rails to the floor, and then put down plywood to have something to screw the wood to. The repair that was done five years ago was done beautifully. It looks great. You can't even tell it was done. Unfortunately, it's gotten wet this time. So what we'll have to do uh, Madam Chair, is take that spot up. It can be repaired, and then the whole floor will have to be sanded and relined. Okay. Are there any other questions or concerns? Is that the same spot that uh, we had to repair five years ago? Yes, sir. It is. And my, my goal or hope this time, um, Mr. Henderson, is that the float system inside the drain pan 
has resolved that and then maybe some preventative maintenance before the units are turned on to check the drain lines will eliminate that in the future. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Thank you. Right. We're at the point where we need to approve the agenda. Madam Chairman, we do have <coughs> three items that we need to add to the agenda. If you would please, we could go with letter G for an asbestos abatement. Letter H is the Navigate Prepared Program. And then finally, letter I is a resolution for the agricultural program for the uh, state legislature. All right. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda with the, uh, with the modifications made. Second. Right. Second. Okay. Any uh, concerns or discussion? All in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. Any opposed? Okay. We need the, to approve the minutes for May 1st, 2018. I need a motion. So moved. Second. 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 All right. All any any discussion? Okay. All in favor of approving the minutes uh, for the May first, uh, 2018 meetings? Please indicate by raising your right hand. Any opposed? All right. I need to approve. I need a motion to approve the minutes for May 18th, 2018. So, so moved. moved. All right. I have a first. Yeah. I have a second. All right. Any discussion? All in favor, indicate by raising your right hand. <coughs> Any opposed? All right. And now I need a motion <coughs> to approve the closed session minutes for May 18th, 2018. And that will be open minutes. If it's a closed session, you have to decide whether yeah. you want to I'd like to make a motion that we approve the closed session minutes and release them from right. the May 18th, 2018 meeting. All right. Second. All right. All, any discussion? All in favor, indicate by raising your right hand. Any opposed? All right, number E, and I think that will be addressed by Dr. Dunsmore. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. This came out of our uh, student assignment committee. Um, as you know, we've been doing a lot of work on uh, student assignments. Um, the McKibben demographic research, what I'm asking for, um, actually Mr. Schwartz had recommended this gentleman in his firm. As you're aware, we had had an evergreen study done years ago um, that was quite expensive and I'm not even sure they're still doing those. We had reached out to NC State who does some similar work and they're about two years behind. Uh, Mr. McKibben did a uh, similar program in Union County and I believe Catawba County was the other one. Um, I had a chance to speak with him and Mr. Schwartz via the phone, um, tried to get some information. He is available to come to our next July board meeting and do a presentation on what he um, would come in and do. Um, he did do a, a price projection there for us also. I also might want to add he had looked at the information Dr. Lewis and I had sent in that he requested is a little preliminary work and was quite impressed with what that committee had done to this point and uh, it actually is reflected in the cost. It's a little bit less than what the original price was. But all I'm asking for tonight is uh, approval to go ahead and allow him to come here uh, and do his presentation and uh, as long as we're on board with that. He uh, shared his turnaround would be very, very quick because um, a lot of the work would be information we will provide here that he can be working on in his own, as well as the time he would spend here in the county. Okay, I need a motion um, to have Dr. McKibben come to our July meeting to discuss uh, his services. 
So move, Madam Chair. Second. Any discussion? Um, Madam Chair, um, um, I would like to know this information that he's going to glean. Dr. Dunsmore, what are your plans for what you're going to do with this information if we decide to approve Well, ultimately what we're looking at is uh, filling empty space and capacity in our buildings um, and uh, of the plan for um, as we have to adjust attendance lines to achieve that ultimate goal. Um, <clears throat> way back, uh, I remember the Evergreen study and the amount, I think it was $100,000 the county commissioners paid for that study. Big pardon? $125,000. I stand corrected, $125,000. Uh, that's a big difference. But anyway, mm -hmm. it, it was a big number. And um, um, it was a very, uh, I've read it, not word for word, but I, I have read it. And uh, it was um, a very broad um, um, sort of information, a bit of information about a lot of different subjects. Now this, this information we're asking for here with this demographic, this is going to be specific to demographic lines in the county and populating schools. Yes, sir. Because that, the other report, it went all into the number of personnel we needed, number of maintenance people. I mean, it was just, uh, and it was almost, um, I don't know how much, Mr. Pridgen was on the Board of Education at the time. I don't know how much uh, information that the Board of Education took and used out of that, but it didn't seem like it was a lot. Um, so, um, Dr. Dunsmore, do you feel like that um, that your staff and the folks we have on board with the information that we have could make these kind of decisions without hiring outside counsel? Um, I think it's always good to bring outside eyes in to look at that and know those trends. One of the things in speaking with the superintendent at Union County who went through this, uh, their staff, uh, they felt did an awful lot of work and missed some things. I think the exact um, term used was uh, missed the forest because some trees got in the way. Um, and I know Mr. Schwartz in speaking with him who has uh, been involved with this outfit and went through these have been very impressed with what they bring to the table. Well, um, Mr. Henderson and I were speaking and we spoke with Mr. Schwartz uh, and he told us he knew of it. He didn't mention a name, but he knew of a company that was good at this. Um, but is this something that we would con need to consider uh, getting bids from other people on or? Um, there is a GIS operation right here across from the Y. I can't remember the name of the company, but I know they do demographic information. Um, I'm asking you. Well, I, if, if the board would, would like me to do that, uh, I'm comfortable in speaking with Mr. or Dr. McKibben. Um, I've spoken to the folks out at NC State that do this and we're involved in other um, processes and one of the things that everybody said it's always good to get somebody it's not um, vested in the area to come in and do these studies because it can be very objective I have, I have a question if you finish no, I, I have no other question okay. um, is there a RFP or a scope that they will be uh, using in order to conduct the study by is it something specific we've asked them to do? Um, that's what he, I came up and what he would come up and bring up. We talked to him what, we're, what our goals are, what we are doing with the moratorium um, in getting um, students back to their domiciles, uh, which was something that uh, he highlighted was a first step. Um, we gave him a lot of the information that we've been working on in the student uh, reassignment committees. Um, so that's what he's coming up to talk to, what he can do specifically in line with the work we've been doing in that committee. So from that conversation, we're going to develop the scope. Mm -hmm. right. And at that point, would it be, I'm, and Arnold, I'm talking to you now, at that point, once the scope is developed, at that point, would it be pro prudent to talk about going out to bids based on that, that developed scope? Did you? I did. I, I okay. thought I, I, um, I thought you were asking that of Dr. No, I'm talking to you because you brought up the bids. 
um, going, you know, looking at other looking at other options. I um, I haven't been privileged. I'm not on the committee, so I haven't been privileged to the discussion uh, as you and everybody else in Wayne County, I guess, know I've been an advocate for a school district line um, ever since I've been on the board. Um, and so many times in my career, it involved things, if you want nothing to happen, you get a consultant and you go ahead into a committee. I want something to happen. Um, so um, my reservation to that, I mean, that's what they are. I mean, I don't want to waste a lot of time, spend a lot of money. To be honest with you, I think I could sit down with the maps and start to begin to make improvements. I've suggested I did at our last meeting. Um, clear things where you can make improvements on our district lines as we speak. Um, but if this is, I mean, I, I'll certainly submit to the collective wisdom of the board. I want to do this. If this is uh, a legitimate step and we're actually trying to make something happen, then I'm all for it. Dr. Dunsmore, this gentleman that is coming, he, he is coming to talk to us about what he would do, yes, what services he would provide. Okay. And I was just going to, and I apologize, Mr. Smith, I might have misunderstood. Um, so he listed um, some areas that he's really going to zero in on. Mm -hmm. This is a basis for that study, and he will talk in more detail. And I guess if we want to broaden that scope, I'm going to have to reach back out to him on that. Um, obviously, I was trying to keep it uh, to the specifics that we are uh, working on. I know time is of an essence with opening a new school next year and some of the overcrowding issues we're facing. Um, but would it be fitting for us to have him come and speak to us and then go out to bid uh, to see who would bid for this job or? It would probably be better to bid prior to. I'm just not sure who else we would send out to that other than um, I can reach out to the company uh, Mr. Flowers suggested at the uh, YMCA. Madam Chair. the YMCA. Mr. Har Dr. Harrell, am I putting you on the spot to ask you if you know of any other agencies that we would send out a bid request for? I'm happy to assist Dr. Okay. But you don't know of any, right? No, no okay. ma'am. I may be familiar with an agency that we used on prior position before I came back home. I'm happy to share with others. Okay. Lynn, I'm sorry. Doc I mean, Mr. Henderson, I'm sorry. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, I have gone online and looked at the uh, the website for McKibben Demographic Research, mm -hmm. and I have noted that there, there has been several counties in North Carolina in which they have done some work for. My concern is um, if we were to put out a RFP or put it out for bid right now with, uh, without hearing him, his presentation, it might put us at, at, at a disadvantage because there are things that may come up during his presentation that may not even be included in this, in this proposal here. So my, my suggestion would be that we wait and listen to the presentation and then determine from that whether or not it would be even necessary uh, to go out and place it out for a, for a bid. I would also like to also ask, uh, while we're talking about this, one of the things I would like to ask the board members to do is, if you remember back a few months, I guess it's been seven, eight months ago, when we first started talking about redistricting, I sent out, a, um, I sent out to each board member a copy of the best practices in district rezoning re, uh, research. Uh, before Mr. McKibben's come, I would ask us to just read that in particular to kind of get ourselves ready for that presentation because it might lead to some discussions that we might need to take further. Do you have the ability to send that out again? Uh, I'll check and see. If not, I do have it here and I can give it to Dr. Dunsmore and have him to okay. have it copied and sent out to everybody. Okay. All right. Any other discussion? Madam Chair, just to clarify myself here, I've talked around in the circle, I guess. Um, I'm all for hearing this gentleman's presentation um, and, and moving, moving forward with this. Um, 
it's just it appears from what I'm looking at here if he comes and gives the presentation he's going to be coming expecting to be, get a contract and um, um, and when I hear his presentation I may, I might be all for giving him a contract but, uh, and, I, and that's the reason I said I respect the collective wisdom of the board on that at that time so I'm an all I'm all for, for hearing his presentation but um, I also want to articulate where that me as a board member, I want to go with this. Okay. And, and and just for point of clarification too, I know I asked a question about RFPs and scopes. Um, this and reading this again, it does appear to be a response to an RFP. Um, and my question about scope now becomes even more prevalent. What was the scope of work that he was given? In order to develop this proposal, that, that's I guess that's kind of where I'm at. And is the same scope available to send out to other potential bidders for the same project? Is there is there a written scope? There wasn't a written scope. It was a conversation between Mr. Schwartz, uh, Dr. McKibben, and myself after I'd spoke to the superintendent, in Union County, and basically the foundation of it was. Um, as we talked, what they went through, we have aging buildings. Um, we have buildings that are sitting empty but aren't in the area that we need to be. Um, everything we had talked about, he understood, realized what it was. Hey, this is what I do. This is what I've done here. Um, I've went and looked at some of those um, work that he's done. Um, so it's really focused in on that, but there was nothing specifically written. Um, I reached out to the companies that I was aware of um, in speaking to others that have done some things, but we can certainly broaden that. Um, I, I quite frankly, when uh, <coughs> spoke to what the uh, charge was to Union County, I was pleasantly surprised because I knew what the cost of the Evergreen study was. and. Um, this gentleman's doing these nationally, not just in North Carolina. Yeah, I, I'm very familiar with the Evergreen study myself, but you're right, the Evergreen study was comprehensive. This is very specific. Um, so I would imagine that it would be considerably less expensive, but, but I, it does concern me that there is no written scope for him to follow. Or, so. Madam well, Chair, can we have a reread of the motion and the second that are on the floor? There isn't. There, there isn't. There was. Yes, yes th there was. There was, there there was, was one that was. I made the motion. And I made and I second. Oh, and it I'm was sorry. Specific, so I'm pretty to sure, to just a presentation. A presentation. The, uh -huh. the motion was to hear it here um, um, as presented was that he come and make a presentation to us on what uh, the scope of his work would be. Okay, so that was your motion? And, and, I made and it you second it. And Dr. Donsmore, did he agree to come to a presentation without it being within contract? I will have to reach out to him. I'm assuming we're going to have to pay his expenses to come in, which will, I would hope would be minimal because he's just over the South Carolina line. So would it be appropriate to ask for a uh, uh, I don't want to use what's the not amendment. What's the word I'm looking for, uh, Mr. Smith? Clarification. Clarification of the motion uh, pending uh, cost of the presentation, uh, as well as uh, asking any other companies that may want to present as well at the July meeting because I'm happy to have them come in unless they're going to charge us a couple of thousand dollars. For that presentation I mean so mr. flowers would you mind if I add that to the motion I, I, I mean amend it depend you know, as long as their proposal is under do we want a uh, cost I think you need to put a cost uh, 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 a cap. Because, right I, I, I think it's even reasonable well if you notice down here he says that to do a presentation for its final forecast is it's going to be nine hundred and fifty dollars. Mm -hmm. So if you say a thousand dollars, I'm sure that should be reasonable because the the presentation that he would make final will be more in depth, more in depth than what he would do coming down here for just a general presentation. I would almost at this point rather not ask for an amendment, but to go ahead and um, call a question and then restate from the beginning. Um, I'll restate the motion. If that's what you're asking. I think with a motion and a second, we actually have to vote on it. One way or the other. We still have some discussion. 
Yeah. We've had a lot of discussion. Um, Dr. Dustmore, let me ask you a question. Um, have there been any provisions or anything? I mean, I, I would love to talk to people in Union County or some mm -hmm. of these counties that he's, he's done this myself, okay? Um, but has there been any provisions for us to send anybody there to sit down and talk with them and actually see what was done in those particular counties? Uh, or have, mm -hmm. other than you just speaking to, to a representative, I don't even know whether they were pleased or not with his work. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, I'd like to dig a little bit deeper. Yeah, I, I can get that information out. out and get it out to the board members. I have that. I, mean, I don't think he would have told you that he worked with those counties if he hadn't they, done, they, I done actually a have good a, job. Yeah. They're, they're actually, they're but, actually it's listed on his website. And I have a video of the board meeting that he actually did a presentation and I watched with that. All right. Do we have a clarification of the motion at this time? Or it's a vote up and down, either or. So do we need to vote the motion um, down that we have on the floor and then come back and restate it? I can, why can't I just restate the motion now? That would be out of order. Or withdraw the current motion. Ask to withdraw the current motion. You could ask to withdraw the current motion and, and start a new motion. But we'd have to get the withdrawal of the second as well, but. All right, I withdraw my motion. I withdraw my second. All right, I'd like to make a motion, Madam Chair. All right. Um, I move that we um, ask this gentleman to come and do his presentation, um, that we be willing to um, compensate him for his ex reasonable expenses. That reasonable amount be to, to be determined by the superintendent. Um, and that his... Uh, if we enter a contract with him that the uh, fee we pay for coming for this presentation would be deducted from his contract amount. What? He's got a contract amount in there. 26900 If we're going to give him 900 to come president, I want him to deduct it from yeah, that amount. Did his contract price include a presentation? Well, he was coming to make one. Yeah, I, I think that's reasonable. I think he would, uh, coming up the 23rd was probably part of that overall cost so if we do you understand hire him, we deduct if we yes, give sir. him 900 for coming now his contract uh, cost projected cost is 26 900 and it would be deducted from their from his original contract price whatever his fee to come up here Understood. yeah all right you understand my motion? that's contingent on the board approving him the way you're speaking to the emotion well, he's just saying if he is contract if yeah, he is yeah, granted a contract so that is our vote but suppose he is not contract. Well, then we, we owe contract, him the $900. We're going to pay his reasonable expenses for coming. And that's it. I'll second his motion. All right. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. All in favor of having Dr. McBibbin come um, to make a presentation to us um, with a fee that will be determined by the superintendent, please indicate by raising your right hand. Any opposed? Same. All right. <laughs> now, are we going to do this during a board meeting or yes, a sir. okay during a board meeting? Okay. And this will be only be one person. Or are we going to look for others? We're going to start with this gentleman. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start looking for others, and I'll do that starting tomorrow. Okay. But you're not going to be asking others to come at the time he does his I, presentation. I, I, I think it's going to be highly unlikely we'll get somebody that quick. Okay. And I, I, would, I would say because of the fact that we want to know the whole scope of what he's going to do before we start inviting other folks in here. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now we have a CTE memorandums of understanding. Madam Chair, as while Ms. Bolton House is walking up, um, one MOU I am asking to be pulled from the agenda, the Bryan Center Health and Rehabilitation Center in Goldsboro uh, received a um, Medicare Medicaid survey that was conducted. They were issued a deficiency. We had gotten contact from uh, the state Department of Health and Human Services that we're no longer allowed to use that facility because of their deficiency rating. 
So we do not need to enter in an MOU with them. So rather than four, there will be just three. Okay. All right, Mrs. Bonehouse. Um, we do have MOUs uh, with Willow Creek and RHA Health Services and with um, Wayne Memorial Hospital for our health science classes. And then we also have one with um, Grantham Fire Department for our EMS program, which is the one that we just approved back in February for this uh, past spring semester. But these are, um, we're requesting that they be approved by the board attorney first, because I've been communicating back with uh, Laura Crumpler with Schwartz and Shaw today. And so your approval should be pending their review because they've not been reviewed by our new attorney. All right, so we need a motion um, to approve um, these um, memorandums of understanding um, pending, legal review. pending legal review. Yes, ma'am. Now, do we have to say anything about the fact that we are removing Bryan Center? Your motion would just be to approve the four. All right. So uh, I need a motion to approve the four agencies uh, pending legal review. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve the memorandum of understanding with uh, uh, the four that were mentioned, uh, uh, master affiliation agreement, also the RHA Health Services, the Grantham Fire Department, and Willow Creek, and uh, pending legal review. I second. All right. Any discussion? Yes, ma'am. Madam Chair, I'd like first to pull up the uh, master affiliation for Wayne Memorial Hospital agreement. Yes. And I would like, first of all, to go to Article 1, Section B. Why would, uh, why would, all right, let me ask this question this way. Would, is the hospital going to be providing any kind of clinical training itself? Yes, sir. They, and it's more supervision because our faculty, they have to be the certified nurses, which they are. And we have two different levels that go to the hospital. One is the CNA class. And then the other is the health science one and the health science two classes when they just go to observe and they don't have the number of hours or the in-depth training. Okay, so, so, so we would not be relying on um, hospital staff to provide any kind of clinical training? Not with the health, uh, with the CNA, no. How about with the other? Well, they're um, the nurses and the doctors that are there, they are providing um, examples, so instruction the reason yes, I ask that is because this statement makes it sound like only the schools are going to be providing training. In the rest of the agreement, when it term, when the term faculty is used, they're talking about our staff. They, right, they, and even in this one, it's talking about just our staff. Correct, but in the rest of the agreement, it, it will talk about hospital staff. They don't term the hospital staff as faculty. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, Article 3, profession, Professional Liability. Can you tell, speak to that? What are we? we have um, every year the Board of Education approves the insurance policies, and then whenever these MOUs are approved, then I contact Phyllis and Phyllis will send the names of the individual companies and they have a writer and a policy um, that we provide with these companies. So we this. provide the insurance that yes, sir. they don't have to provide the insurance. No, sir. Okay. Article three where it talks about criminal background checks in all states. Which one is that? A, B, C, or D? I think it's K on page three. Okay. And it, that is for 
not the students who are doing the job shadowing, but the ones who are doing the um, CNA. The CNA? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question with that one. Uh, because it says, uh, such criminal background checks shall be conducted in all state countries where the student or faculty has lived, worked, or gone to school either within the past 10 years or from the date that the assigned individual turned 18 years of age. So if I, were, if I was in that program and I turned 18 years old tomorrow, how, f how much of a background check are you in doing? It would be 10 years. Mm -hmm. And very few of the students that are doing the CNA are, are already 18. So you don't have CNAs that are seniors? Yes, sir. But like I said, it's you know half and half. Some are 18 already, and some aren't. Not all of them are 18. But when they're doing the CNA, they're having a background check. And so, so, but see, the question I, that that it raises for me is that last uh, phrase, or from the date that the assigned individual turned 18 years of age, whichever is shorter. Shorter. Mm -hmm. So if I turned 18 tomorrow, it would be shorter. Right. Ms. Bolthouse. Yes, sir. Are, are these the same basic agreements we've always uh, we've agreed on? Yes, sir. I mean, is, has anything changed in any of The else? only one that has changed is Way Memorial because they're now with um, no, no, no. UNC Healthcare, no, no. and so theirs has a, you know, a few more of their agreements and forms, the appendixes, appendices that um, they want signed this time by the students that are in the CNA program. Thank you. I noticed it also says that HIPAA training is provided by the hospital, but how about the OSHA and the bloodborne pathogens and those, are they provided by our clinical staff, our faculty? Those are provided to the health science too before they go into the CNA, and um, all of our students are able to do the 10-hour OSHA training, and that's one of the credentials that we provide. That so we that's pay done for. before they could even go to the hospital? Well, it's done for all of our health science too, whether they're intending to go to the hospital or not. Yes, sir. Okay. That's my question. Okay. Any other questions or concerns? <coughs> okay. We need a motion to approve. Am I we correct? Already have we already have a motion. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have a motion? That was your discussion. Oh, that was my discussion. I'm sorry. All right. All of those in favor, uh, please indicate by raising your right hand. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Uh. Madam Chairman, I'd like to address item G, please, on your agenda that was added. Okay. You have a manila folder that looks like mine. <coughs> Excuse me. And in order, um, you should have, I have a blue sticky note on the first paper clipped items together. The top one says Impuricon. So this is coming to you from the facilities committee if you may recall in February of this year we had a water line to rupture under the floor of the weight room slash wrestling room at Eastern Wayne High School so we were able to get that um, cleaned out get the water out of it and we had to take in three bids for the asbestos abatement the floor there at Eastern Wayne High School has VCT tile over an asbestos subfloor. The building was the old New Hope High School cafeteria when it was built. So these bids here, I put them in order. The, the top bid is the low bid from Impuricon for abating 3,470 square feet at a cost of $16,320. And this comes to you uh, in recommendation from the facilities committee to approve the low bid for Impuricon. So if you could please approve that, I would greatly appreciate it. I move that we accept the low bid. A second. Any discussion? This for both of them or just for? Just for Eastern Wayne. This Eastern is just for Eastern Wayne. Wayne. Okay. I guess the attachments are the other agencies. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, um, and so the first one is the $16,320. Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. Ma Any discussion? So we're ready for the vote. 
All in favor? I don't see the name of the company. In Pure Con is at the top of the first Okay. Item. In Pure Con in Pure. Incorporated. All in favor of approving, um, accepting the bid from In Pure Con Incorporated for Eastern Wayne High School, indicate by raising your right hand. Any opposed? Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. The next uh, package you have there with another blue sticky note is for Fremont Stars Elementary School. Just want to point out a few differences in there to that all these are exactly the same. So at Fremont, we have three areas that we have some asbestos that needs to be abated. Uh, of course, this is in the 1923 building at Fremont Stars. There is a um, admin office up front. And I've highlighted those for you on, on the first page of Impuricons. There's also a break room. There's a break room downstairs that has black and white um, nine by nine square asbestos tile. And then there is a room upstairs that is used as a break room or lounge upstairs that has the original tile, which is, I believe, red and green. Now, if you just want to uh, denote a square footage difference, you may see there, I had a question asked from Upiricon as to why there's 1,750 square feet to be abated. And when you were to look at the next uh, one for the, or the very last one, excuse me, with square footage, which would be Dari. They did 2,450 square feet, and of course their price is higher. So what we have at Fremont Stars on the bottom floor of the building in the break room and the administrative office is that floor has two floors down. It has two layers of 9x9 nine nine asbestos tile. So the higher bid and the difference in the square footage is they doubled the square footage for those two rooms downstairs. And PureCon is going to take both those out at the same time. So that's where you'll see the difference in the square footage there. So if this comes from facilities committee asking approval um, to accept in PureCon's bid so we can begin the process of abating at Fremont Stars Elementary School. Okay. Madam Chair, I make a motion that we accept the in PureCon bid for the asbestos abatement at Fremont Elementary. I second. All right. Any discussion? All in favor, indicate by raising your right hand. Any opposed? Okay. Was yours an opposed vote? I'm sorry? Was yours an opposed vote? No. No, sir. He oh. voted late. <laughs> yeah, we got it in. <laughs> <coughs> Madam Chairman, for item H in your manila folder, the very last packet is um, the Navigate proposal that Dr. Dunsmore will address. We had the uh, folks from Navigate come up and do a presentation. Um, Mr. Henderson was there. Um, I've reached out to other companies, um, none of which could get this done by the start of the school year. Um, their price was not in line with where we were at, and they didn't meet um, all the areas that Navigate brought. Uh, as you know, we had our statewide meetings, and we are eligible for a grant. And speaking with Dr. Ben Matthews at DPI, um, he's suggesting um, there's several counties here east of 95 that are going to go with this program that uh, in order to get these grants moving and approved that we have to be on the books and roll with them. So I'm very hopeful um, the startup fee, which is on the page two, number three A, will be covered by the grant. Um, we're going to be asking in a grant for about four times that much. Um, and it has to all be, uh, the grant requirements are very specific to hardware stuff. Um, so we're going to be looking at camera upgrades, uh, tape monitors, and swipe cards, as well as this Navigate program. Uh, but to get on their calendar so we can get the training and be ready to go for the start of the school year, I am asking that the board to approve uh, this contract. Madam Chair? Yes. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the contract with Nav Navigate for the security matters. I'll second. Okay. Any discussion? I will, uh, I can speak to it. I will speak to the fact that I did attend the uh, presentation that was done by Navigate. I was very impressed by their a delivery and all of the services that they would be able to provide for us, including the issue of uh, mapping out every room in every school, 
uh, giving us a 360 degree uh, view of what those uh, rooms would look like. So in case of emergencies and these um, atrocities that we've been having lately in the schools across the county, I mean across the country, uh, we will be better prepared to address those issues in a more timely manner. Okay. I have a question, Dr. Dunsmore. Could you re, um, um, address again how we're going to pay for this? So um, the General Assembly and the governor has freed up safety and security money. Um, it's a big pot of money. So the way the DPI is doing that is an ADM per student amount. Um, so we're, uh, we're going to have to have all the grant work in. Uh, we started that work this weekend. Uh, we have to have it in by the second week of July, and then we'll have the money, hopefully, prior to the start of the school. Would be, that be $96,000 We're hoping more. to have about four times as that. Four times that, much. okay. Yes. Right. Based on our ADMs and the projections, we're going to be eligible somewhere around 400 and some change. Okay. And, and Dr. D, <coughs> excuse me, Madam Chair, Dr. Dunsmore, in case those funds, because we know how the state is very slow in doing that, we could agree to allow those funds to come out of um, the capital outlay un until those funds are actually delivered and then be reimbursed back into capital outlay. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, yes, Mr. Mr. Smith. Okay. Um, the there's a thirty-two thousand dollar per year mm -hmm. um, licensing uh, fee for the f not guaranteed not to increase for three years. Uh, an invoice on July 1st of each year. Mm -hmm. Now that 32,000, that's coming from us, then, right? Is that yeah? After the first year, yes, sir. Okay, and um, so and that's in perpetuity, pretty much. Yes. Okay. So that's ongoing training, uh, software updates, um, and they monitor the uh, emergency call system. So um, when we build the uh, the uh, pyramid, for lack of a better term, and who's on the call list, the sheriffs, the MT, fire, ambulance, uh, all the police areas. Um, so the ongoing updating of that platform and assuring that our whole call systems, that's, they handle that. But now, if we receive the grant, mm -hmm. and we only, let's say we only use a, a, a $100,000, we have that money in store to continue paying for this until that money the grant runs out. money has to be used for the actual hardware and the stuff. Okay. All right. So yes. it's a one-time thing, and then that's yes. that's why you. Yes. Okay. So they have they have a separate. Us. So the uh, safety and yeah. security grant has four arms to it. Um, one is uh, for additional um, human capital SROs. Um, so we can't supplant. Um, the good news is our county had authorized those four additional SROs for us. We are going to be asking for additional money. Again, it's based on our ADM, so it's money. If we can get it, we're going to get it. Um, there's a hardware piece of that, and then there's a piece for um, uh, building upgrades. Right now, they're only going to be giving the building upgrades to Tier 1 counties. We're a Tier 2 county, so we're not eligible for that for another year. And one other thing, Dr. Dunsmore, you did say that there were other uh, school systems in our region yeah. that were out in this region. Um, yeah. Onslow has signed on with them. There's uh, uh, several down around um, Charlotte, Mac, but here in our region, Onslow signed on with them. Um, Green County signed on with them. Brunswick signed on with them, and New Hanover um, was in the process. So was there any discussion about a consortium? Well, that's actually this price that they gave us to was come in is, is pretty much what he had <coughs> and that company came in and did. And I think that's, as I was calling around to other companies that aren't quite as comprehensive of this and I was getting ballpark figures, mm -hmm. yeah, they, they, they did a good job of the initial setup because for them to bring in the equipment to do that, it's more cost effective, obviously. They can come out here to Northeast North Carolina and knock us all out and move on. All right. All right. Are we ready for a vote? And the vote is to um, engage, navigate, prepared contract services for school safety. All in favor, indicate by raising your right hand. Any opposed?
Next, Madam Chair, I was asked, and I, again, I apologize for the lateness of this. There's a lot of talk out in the General Assembly about our, our agricultural programs here in the state, and particularly Senate Bill 711, which is the North Carolina Farm Act, and it's 2018, so there's a lot of discussion out there. They are asking counties, particularly that are tied to agriculture, that we do a resolution in support of the, of the agricultural community. And it is a resolution. If I could, ma'am, I, I will read it, and the board then uh, could uh, please approve. But it's whereas the agriculture and agribusiness is the number one industry in North Carolina, contributing $85 billion to our state's economy. I apologize, I didn't get the exact number of what it is to our county, but I know it's a large, large number. Whereas we enjoy a food supply that is abundant, affordable, and among the world's safest, thanks in large part to the efficiency and productivity of North Carolina farmers. And whereas our farmers provide the food, fuel, and fiber for our state and country, whereas agriculture touches the lives of everyone, whether it be in our daily meals or clothes we wear, whereas farmers support other community businesses in the local economy, whereas it is estimated that we are going to in, need to increase food production by at least 70% by the year 2050 to meet the growing world food demands, whereas we are losing farmland at an alarming rate and it's getting progressively more difficult to recruit and retain farmers willing to work our state's land, and whereas we need to support our agricultural industry and our farmers and encourage a safe and abundant food supply now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the School Board of Wayne County Public Schools, do hereby support Senate Bill 711 and the Farm Act, and it would be dated this day, June 27, 2018. Okay. I'd like to make a motion that we approve. A second. Any discussion? Um, the only, I, I, I don't, I can't see anything in particular that we, we could support. It's just that um, not having read the bill and everything that's in it, you know, to express support for something that we've not read, you know, I think is uh, something that causes me pause for concern because I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that it's Senate Bill 711 it is what it says it is, but I just never had a chance to read it. You know, and I know that's a resolution, um, but the bill itself, um, I'm sure, contains additional language. So um, that's my only hesitation. But I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not prepared to vote against it. It's just that I just don't know what's in the bill. Okay. Any other comments? I would like to echo, okay. echo the comments of uh, Mr. Smith. All right, and Mr. Dunsmore? No, I was just going to say I didn't read the, the bill. It was presented to me just because of, we're an agricultural community to support the, the agricultural. I, um, I too, have not read the bill. Uh, and I've, I've heard that concern mentioned also, you know, um, by other folks uh, concerning this bill is that they hadn't, uh, there's always a bill. So, but it's my understanding the resolution, it's a resolution. Uh, I'm in favor of this because I feel like it's a resolution on our port in support of agriculture and uh, in North Carolina farming. I would like to put a thing, say one thing too, that a large part of that number is forestry. Most people don't consider um, <laughs> forestry as agriculture, but forestry is agribusiness. <coughs> so I do support it. And uh, having said that, I'd like to make a motion we approve this. Already moved and seconded. We've been we got, got, yeah. Yeah. Well, you got a third now. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually trying to Google the number that Forrester contributes, but and it's on here, but I can't read it. <laughs> so any of do you any get a hold of Mr. So Flowers? <laughs> okay. Are we ready for a vote? All in favor of approving the resolution for agriculture, indicate by raising your right hand. Any opposed? We have an abstention. Right, one abstention. One abstention. All right. Okay, let's 
So have we covered everything? Now we're, we're down, down to the consent agenda. And we need to, I need a motion to pull the personnel. Or did we get it all straight? Let's get it straight. <laughs> we did have to amend it. Madam Chair. Yes. I would like to make a motion that we approve the consent agenda with the amendment that was made, what was the last section called? To the personnel report. To the personnel report. Okay. Yes. Madam no. Chair. And that okay. covers it, so I need a second. Second. Madam Chair, I'd like uh, to uh, pull the uh, item F, approval of contracts for a separate vote and uh, some discussion. Can't and discuss. And I'll second that because I wanted to make. This, I would like to ask the same. You thing. can. You can pull it. We can pull, but can we discuss? We can yeah. once, once you remove it from the consent agenda, then you can discuss. Gotcha. It. That, okay. That, okay. The I'm purpose of the consent mm -hmm. agenda. That's the reason you pull it. Okay. But I have two motions on the floor. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. You got one motion. One motion. One I'm motion just because I was going to ask the same thing. So. But you can pull anything. I'm okay. Okay. With All right. Okay. But now, Madam Chairman, I, I, I now now wait a minute. You you basically do because Ms. Strickland moved to approve the consent agenda with the amended personnel report. On yes, it. she so did. Mr. Flowers that. is moving to uh, amend the consent agenda to remove mm -hmm. the item F. The item F. So those would be two different motions. So the Ms. Strickland can either withdraw her motion. I'm willing to amend my motion. To allow for Mr. Flowers' removal of item F. Can you wait till I ask for some things to be made? Golly gee, I, re I <laughs> rescind yes, my I motion. Please, thank you. And if who was the second? second? I think it was uh, Mr. West. Mr. West, so would you yes. rescind your second? I rescind my second. Thank you. Okay. Now, <laughs> we are in preparation to vote for the consent <laughs> agenda. Any concerns? Or discussion. Matt. Well, what you're what you're ready for is Mr. Flowers' motion to amend the consent agenda to remove item F. All right, but he yeah, but also we have has other items items we'd like to remove, remove too. Remove so two. can we name all those first? What is the one that you want to remove? Well, I've got. Uh, I'd like to remove number fifty-one thirty, which is a first reading. Uh, number 70, 7920 policy and policy number um, 8300, okay. which is the second read. And it's really more for a point of clarification on those t policies than anything else. What was the second one? Mine is I for a point of clarification. All right, we have I. Okay, this is what we're yeah, asking to be a number. pool. Yeah. We're asking for F, approval of contracts and POs. Right. We're asking for I, budget resolution. We're asking for K, policy 5130. And we are asking for S, policy 83. So I need and, a and motion. policy 7920. Oh, jeez. R, R also. R, okay, R and S. R, okay. So F I K R and S. F I K R and S. Yes. Well, wait a minute. I may want to pull one myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's your time. All right. We need a motion. So we need a motion to amend the consent agenda to remove items F I K R and S. And the amended personnel report. You can vote on that separately. Separately. Are we pulling the, the personnel report since we're doing all of this? Doesn't really need to be pulled. All right. For more discussion. So. But you can't let it go in as it is because no, it has to be It just it has to be amendment. worded properly. Yes, she has I'd like to, to make a motion that we approve the agenda with the removal of F, K, I, R, and S, and accepting the amendment of the personnel report. I'll second that. All right. I'm tired. We're lucky. Okay. <laughs> and we need a vote to do this. Right. To I'll approve. The, okay. So all in favor, indicate by a show of the right hand. Any opposed? All right. And now we are open for discussion on F. All right. Um,
Okay, board members on the summary. Okay. Okay, item two. Uh, the annual service agreement for Spring Creek Middle and Goals, uh, Grantham Middle on the solar management. My question um, is Duke Power was going to pay us for any overage in power uh, from these two schools. We entered in this manage agree management agreement to keep them up so that they would be performing correctly. Um, but my question is, how are we doing with Duke Power? Uh, we do get um, monthly uh, rebate amounts back from Duke Power. I don't have the you know, total year to date amount, but I can get that. Okay. Maybe if you could get out. us that in for my, well, it probably varies each month. So if we could have some kind of history on how we're doing with that because the board, if you remember, we all of the discussion uh, about that. So um, I, I'm in favor of the contract. The other uh, question I had, and this may be totally different, but item number four, uh, there's a, uh, a management solutions there, uh, thought exchange software services for district survey planning. Um, I don't know what that program does, but is there a possibility that that program is, would be doing something that we're fixing to consider hiring somebody to do? No, that's, this? That, that program is our surveys that we put out um, last year, that we're gonna continue doing those surveys, so they manage that and put those out. But it has nothing to do with no, school no, district. Sir. Okay, I have no other questions. Mr. Hayes, let me ask you one question. Yes, sir. Outside of the monthly revenues we receive from Duke for our overages, if we have any, did, we did receive, we have received some lump sum checks. We, we have received um, a couple of lump sum checks also. Right. Yes, so, I was going to include that in. And I don't know that the purpose of Mr. Flowers' questions, but I think it is to see maybe if what we get back is going to cover just, some just, of that maintenance cost. Yeah, just see see where we're at. We all, uh, the Board of Education, uh, uh, we all went kind of out on limb, I guess, uh, and that this was completely new technology. And um, I think it would be interesting to see exactly where we're at because it was my understanding that the units would be upsized um, by maybe 20%. Anybody can correct me. If they can remember better, but they were upsized so that there would be an uh, uh, energy left over from the operation of the schools to sell back into the grid, and Duke Power would pay us for that. And you said we are getting paid, but we've never received, to my recollection, any real numbers on where we're at with that. You, you understand? Okay, I will provide yeah. uh, okay. that information. All right. um, correct me. You just said something that's I've never heard before, okay? <laughs> and um, I was under the understanding when we did this with these schools that we were told that we would pay a monthly bill and at the end of the year, Duke would send us a lump sum check on what was accumulated during the year. And you just said we received monthly checks from them? We did. Okay, well that's different than how we were told. Well, monthly, yearly. Um, okay. um, I also know that we had to scrap that uh, battery unit that was there too when we had to cut expenses at the schools too. Um, and that plays a big impact on what we sell to the grid. And just, it, it just brought this fresh to mind that we were doing this um, uh, service contract to um, um, and it also brings to mind um, if we are receiving additional funds, do we need to put, designate some funds to accumulate to repair these things? Because I think the life on them was like 20 years. Um, anyway, um, thank you, Mr. Hayes. If you'll get that for us. I don't have any other questions. I would like to add that money, in my opinion, that Brady trained that we're paying Brady Train is well worth the investment because right. it's already proved itself in at Grantham. 
middle school. So. Well, we, yeah, we we didn't do it to start with, right? Right. Correct me if I'm wrong. We didn't do it to start with, and then we come back and we still have. Yeah, so. uh, and because Brady Train was kind enough to identify some issues down yeah. there, so. outside of a contract that brought our attention to it. So. Okay. Okay. Um, but my there's... my uh, uh, wanting to pull the um, uh, POs, contracts and POs. I actually voted to approve this in the um, in the uh, finance meeting. However, since that time period, I have spoken with some teachers and some maintenance personnel. And um, item number 16, high standard cleaning. Uh -huh. We have always had a question as to the original contract as to whether they were going to provide the materials to clean with and we were under the understanding that they were going to. I also understand that we have a stockpile of cleaning materials that have not been used and I would like for that to be investigated. And then the other thing is in speaking with some of the teachers, um, they, said, um, they said that they certainly would appreciate a um, a survey to be done, maybe on Survey Monkey or whatever, so that we can get input from them on the cleaning of their classrooms, because they said the quality of the cleaning has gone downhill uh, since this contract was awarded. So we're looking at two different things. If I and I want to be corrected here, <clears throat> we're looking in this contract with paying them just for stripping and waxing the floors during the summer months. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, but that does not, this is separate from our regular cleaning contract <coughs> with them. Is that it, correct? It would be separate. Okay, all right. I also understand that when that's been done before in the past, that there was a pretty shoddy job done and that they waxed right over some of the stuff that should have been stripped and the places that had been. So with that, I prefer I prefer to vote against that contract until we can further investigate it. But I know we're under a timeline and it's got to be done while school's out. So I'm just, I, I asked that. Ask Madam, Chair. Madam Chair. Mr. Hayes, and you may not know this, you may know it, Mr. Sauls may know it. They're not stripping and whack, that's just only at what, how many schools is it? About six, six or seven. Yeah, because there's a lot, of, the majority of our schools are stripping and waxing their own floors, still. <clears throat> and I can't remember, why did we decide to do, why did we decide to just to do a few of them? In the, well, we in were the pilot, piloting, piloting. We were piloting it to try it to see if it was better. But actually, so that's why we uh, chose the central attendance area. We did some of the floors we had done. And Madam Chair. Yes. I'd like to also speak to that because uh, we did have presentation by high standards cleaning and another uh, janitorial custodial um, company come in just recently. And one of the things that I had recommended to Dr. Harold and others is that maybe we need it before we would even consider approving any kind of extension or new contract with high standards that some members of the board or the facilities committee needed to go out and kind of look at some of these schools for ourselves. Or get some input from a survey. Look, yeah. Some, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we, we could do well, both of them. I had, I had one teacher that she said, um, I, would, I would advise you if you did a survey, not to survey the principals, but to survey the teachers. Because they're the ones that are having to sweep and clean their own classrooms because it's not getting done. When is this, con this current contract with high standards up? Is it, uh, it was it's only up, a year, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, up June 30th. September to June 30th. June 30th. Part of my concern right now is getting the floors there. I've already started stripping the button and waxing the floors. My understanding is we have day orders at these schools now, so if they pull out June 30th, we're going to have floors that are going to come to a standstill. So we're voting on something tonight that's already been started, uh, the process has already started? Yes, sir, because they go to the end of this month. So a school got out and some of the schools, they started the process of stripping bikes and for summer. Okay. Well, I mean, it's not that they're stripping the bikes, they're stripping the bikes and they're stripping the bikes. Well, might I say, uh, Dr. Harrell, um, you or some of your folks um, 
um, before we, if, if we're going to move forward with this, um, before we release funds to them, you double check and make sure it's done satisfactorily. You know. But this doesn't open a new contract, does it? Because this should be separate. Yeah, this is uh, to take care of the, um, the floors yeah. for those schools during the July time. All right, so what happens with the contract that, that we have with them in June? The contract that we currently have for them to take care of the schools that they have in the uh, central attendance area will be ended. And so there would have to be uh, either a new contract or an extension of it or an expansion, reduction, whatever the case may be. But that contract ends June 30th. And But that and doesn't impact the work that's needing to be done in this uh, for this no, no. This okay this all right yeah. now I understood you just to say that the contract that ended June the 30th with high standard was for the central attendance area well whichever schools they have I believe they're all central attendance they may not be the, but I thought they serve with some other schools as well yeah. don't they they do Eastern Wayne High School Edgewood yeah, I, th I think I'm just right asking a question yeah. because yeah. he said yeah. central attendance I didn't yeah. consider yeah. Eastern Wayne a central attendance area yeah. school. That's why I was asking the yeah. question. That's an old term we need to quit using anyway. Well, I'm just going about what was said. So. Yeah, I know. That went away with the, uh, when the city ago. <laughs> Madam Chair, my question is relative to item 26, the uh, renovation of the CTE kitchen at Charles B. Acock. How did that come about? How did uh, that that purchase order come about? That, um, uh, that's a, uh, a CTE project to actually go in and, and take care of remodeling the, the cabinets and so forth. So I don't know if it was a request of the principal or just coming through CTE. I, I don't have that information. So th this is actually coming out of CTE funds? Yes. It is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Are there any more concerns on this one? And we can move forward to budget resolution I. Do we need to vote on it? Oh, we're going to vote on each one? I make a motion. But now I've right. got the, all the different, how do you have it packaged, just one section? Everything is together on F. Because you have different people with different questions about different portions of things. We had two, four, and 26. And I think that was the only, those were the only ones. Okay. Uh, let me see about the, uh, uh, 16. We discussed items 2, 4, 16, and 26 on approval of contracts and POs. Madam so Chair, I, I make a motion that we approve item F, approval of contracts, because we had pulled the whole thing off mm -hmm. of the consent agenda. Um, so I make a motion, we approve them all. Okay. Second. All right. Any discussion? Further discussion? All right. All in favor, indicate by raising your right hand. Yep. All in favor, indicate by raising your right hand. All right. All, <laughs> all that are opposing. Okay. So we do not approve. No, somebody else can come back with a different motion. Okay. If there, if, for example, there might be only one item out there that we all do not agree on. So you can, uh, you could approve since you had four that were the points of discussion. You can start with a motion to approve everything but items 2, 4, 16, and 26. And then you can do each of those individually so that people can vote and see which uh, item which item is the one that the people have a disagreement with. All right. I need a motion. Well, I think we already had that a motion to approve everything. 
That failed. Then yeah. that failed. So now I need a motion to approve each item. So I'm taking item number two. I need a motion. Hold tight. No, it was, you need well, a motion yeah. to approve all of them except, except. two, four, I mean, whatever it is. It's two, four, 16, and 26, I believe. So moved. Okay. Second. Second. All right. All in favor of approving the contracts and POs except for items 2, 4, 16, and 26, please indicate by raising your right hand. Any opposed? All right. So now start with item 2. I I'd need like to a make a motion to that we approve item number 2. Second. Item number. Item number 2. two. All Ready train services. That's the one we just voted on, didn't we? No, no we, we excluded pulled number that. two. Oh, okay, we excluded it. Oh, perfect. All right, so all of those in favor of item number two, which is the annual service agreement for Spring Creek Middle School and Grantham Middle School solar management, please indicate by raising your right hand. All right, any opposed? I'd like to make a motion that we approve number four. Need a second. Second. All right. Those in favor of, prudent, prove, uh, of approving item number four, which is? Fulcrum Management Solutions. Yes. And that is for the survey planning and execution. Indicate approval by raising your right hand. Any opposed? Okay. I need it for 16. I need to make a motion that we approve item number 16. I need a second. I second. All right. Um, all in favor of approving item number 16, which is high standards cleaning. Any discussion? Well, it, we already discussed it. <laughs> well, this is individual okay. specific. But it's individuals. Do we need to go another round of discussion for? What? Well, call for whether any there's, if there's any additional discussion that's necessary. Any discussion? Just real quickly, this is specific to stripping and waxing these floors at these schools. This has nothing to do with the contract for next year of cleaning the classrooms. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that we need to go ahead and get this done. I know how much good work that they have done at other schools, especially when they had to clean up Meadow Lane as bad a shape it was in. And I've heard nothing but positives on that. And that is why I made the motion to approve. Any discussion? I'd Anyone? just like to say, Madam Chair, that uh, and maybe I can, maybe I'm going to vote for it. I just want to make a point, and this certainly is is a. We need to look at this very closely. This doesn't ever happen again because we've already got people doing work, and we've not approved the payment of it. So if we were not to approve this contract, we've got people out there that have already done work that would expect yeah. to be paid, and we've not approved a contract for. Them. That's my whole concern about it. Well, we actually have a contract in place for work that's done. Now, it ends June 30th. So anything they were to do in July. Um, so why are we voting on this now if they've already started doing this work? I thought I heard you say that they've already started stripping and waxing floors. Yeah, I asked the this question. contract is for stripping and waxing floors. That they've already started doing. Well, the, um, th there's work that continues into July. Um, when school ended for you know some of these schools they began the preparation of taking care of things for the, the summer which I was part that, of the wax this is very specific to a dollar figure in school buildings and it is a separate contract and I understood Dr. Harold to say that work for this specific line item has already begun one of the things that we're doing with the facilities is we're looking at the process of bidding out all of the services privatizing our services I stand as well as SSC gave us recommendations we gave us quotes for what they would do. So through this contract price negotiation, we have not extended any contract for high standard cleaner cleaning to continue their services throughout all of the next year. So the discussion began, uh, Mr. West, as the current contract came to an end and we have no people in place. Because each of these schools, I understand, is correct, we only have two day orders because I was not here, but I understand the custodial staff at that time may have been pullers in other places mm -hmm. because they took over. Mm -hmm. So if they are not renewed, and 
and they end their services based on the current contract on June 30th, we will have no one in place to finish the floors. And I completely understand that, but I don't think this is a good practice for us to have people performing work for a contract that we haven't voted on. Yes, well, and it may be as we look at custodial services because of, you know, at the time the school gets out of June uh, 10th or somewhere there, and then they amend it again, maybe we, re if we do this in the future, maybe we restructure our contract dates as to when you start. Services. Well, this should have been bid out and voted on in April or May. In the private way. industry, you would, this is not a practice you would want to, I mean, I, we may have. All right, Mrs. That's Smith. Whole, that's my whole hold up with it. All right, Mrs. Yeah. Smith. I have, a, I have a slightly different understanding of what I'm hearing. And my understanding is that if the contract is allowed to run out June 30th, then all work will cease. Right now, they are working under the current contract. This is a request for an extending that contract so that we can get the work done over the summer. And they're not working under this contract. They're working on the contract that extends that right. ends on June 30th. So yes. I, yes. I'm, I'm very clear on that. Okay. It's, okay. It's no, I'm but not, well, I'm not, not, I'm not not what it all. It doesn't say about anything about an extension. Well, it's a new contract, but they're not is going to. Extension? Is this contract, contract does not commence until we approve it. We are currently doing what work they're doing under the current contract that exists and expires on June 30th. They're not doing work on, they're not doing two contracts at the same time. All right. I, I get it. Okay. Are we ready for the vote? Madam Chair, I'd like to call for the vote. All right. All in favor of approving uh, the a contract with um, high standards cleaning, please indicate by raising your right hand. All right. Those opposed? All right, motion carries. All right, item 26, I need a motion. I'd like to make a motion that we approve item 26. Second. Any discussion? All right. All in favor of approving item number 26 with Newcomb cabinets, um, please indicate by raising your right hand. Any opposed? Same. All right, motion carries. Yeah, it's that easy. Hmm? It's that easy. Uh, well, I don't know that that was easy, but. <laughs> I'd like to make a motion that we approve item number I. Just item second. number, item I. <laughs> it's not really item, a number, is it? Item I. Well, item who, I. who pulled it? Uh, it was pulled when we pulled F I K S N R. Yes, I know that. I, I think I'd be a problem. Well, yeah. so the, is there yeah. a question? The, it, it was basically a question. It wasn't. Um, so you've got a motion to approve. I. Mm-hmm. Second. Yes. Second. All right. Discussion. Yes, I got a question relative to uh, your capital outlay fund. Yes. What is that state business? Those are buses. We lease, um, or we actually replace our buses, and the state provides us uh, the funds to make the payments to pay for the buses. So that's our projection of what we will pay um, in eighteen nineteen. And the local appro uh, appropriation is two million. What two happens to the funds that's left from the previous year? They roll over into. So we don't 18, include 19. them in our budget for this year, upcoming well, year? Well, we, we're in the midst of closing out uh, this year, and so once I know totally what the number is, we'll come back and, and add that in. Based on that, based on that, I would recommend that we not approve it until we know what all the funds are, budgets are. Any other discussion? All right, we have a motion on the floor to approve the budget resolution 2018-2019. All in favor, show by raising your right hand. Any opposed? One. Motion carries. I'd like uh, to make a motion that we approve, I think K is next. Yes. There we go. Check and for our first reading. What was that? K. Okay. And I need a second. Second. 
All right. Any discussion? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, this is item 5130, and even though I didn't think we voted on first readings, but it's in here in the consent agenda. So, but anyway, um, I have I have a question. If you look at the last uh, paragraph, the principal or designee of each high school shall make the application forms described in in uh, the general statute 163A-862 available to all students and others who are eligible to register or pre-register to vote. Voter registration forms are available at, and it gives the mm -hmm. website, assisting students in the completion <coughs> of the forms may only be done by board employees who volunteer to do so. So my question is this, is this the voter registration board? Is it the board of education? Is it who is? Good question. The, who is the board employees? Who are the board employees as mentioned in here? Mr. West, do you want me? Ma'am. Do you want me to speak about that? Please, if okay. you will, because we, we, we go ahead. You, you can okay. explain it. We did it in a policy committee. So we, so we were discussing that in a policy committee meeting. Then, Mr. West, you can chime in as well as Ms. Bird, and that was there. So that um, assisting students in the completion of forms may only be done by board um, employees. That is the board of election yes. committee. That's who that is referring okay, to. Okay, so the three people that make up the board of elections will come in and actually register the people to vote? It may be volunteers that they right. have selected that they to have come selected. in, like they normally, like they used to do. So it really needs to be more of a board of board. elections employees or volunteers. Or, or mm -hmm. volunteers at the board of elections. Volunteers approved by the board, board of yeah. elections. So we can okay. clean that up at the next policy. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can do that. Well, look, it, it's my understanding that they were going to provide the volunteers. Is they that were, yes, that's correct. That's why we said board of board of election volunteers. It's just very vague the way it the, mm -hmm. the way it reads right it's, now. I don't know whether by reading that I don't no, know whether it's so no, sitting no, around this table. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I mean, is that the way it came mm -hmm. back to yeah. us, Dr. Mason? That's the way it, came. <coughs> it is. It is. We can make that correction and actually specify board of election okay. so that we know that we're speaking to that board. Okay. Yes, that's all, that's all I wanted to know. Because okay. we were kind of walking through this with point of clarification. That's right. Yes, sir. And, and make sure you extend it out and volunteers uh, of the board of elections, okay. not any volunteer, exactly. any particular volunteer. No, it yeah. has to be volunteers approved by the board, board of elections. elections. Right, I wanted to make sure that was in there as well. Okay, we will. Now these students have to be 18? Yes, seven. in the high school, yes sir. That's correct. Well, seven, isn't it 17, it is 17 18? 17. They need early. to be 18 by voting time. That's by the right. date of vote? Mm-hmm. Yes. Surely, anybody that, high, that far along in high school can fill out a voter registration form. But anyway. Okay. <laughs> So okay. You made a motion to approve this, did you? Yes, because it's a first reading, so we can fix it coming back as the second reading. So unless y'all really want me to amend my motion, I'm going to leave it as is. I need some clarity, Madam Chair. All right, what is it that you need? Okay, this is under the consent it's agenda. Under. It's a first reading. If we pass, pass this, does that mean that it's law? Nope. Or does it mean it come back as a second reading? That's my understanding. It doesn't yeah. seem we like to me that this should be something that was under consent agenda. In, in the past, yeah, we've never done it. In the past, we had had first re readings just as informational only and not considered to be voted on in consent agenda. Now, well, Mr. Worden, if you remember, we, we put a couple of these things. There's another one, I think, that's a first reading under the consent Consent agenda but because we wanted to approve tonight. Right. Yes, we did. But I think that in, in order to address your concerns, um, we need to vote against approving it tonight and take it back to policy to make the corrections that have been indicated here. I think because we were in the discussion, we understood what we were saying yeah. because there had been, um, it had been discussed previously and then we investigated the situation because we wanted the Board of Election to be involved in the process yes. rather than just placing it on one teacher who through his planning period or lunch is trying to reach these kids to be the to assist them. Now let me ask you a quick question. Um, 
in there a time limitation when somebody registers to vote before they can vote in the election? I mean, they have to, is it 30 days, 60 days? I'm or not something sure, but there is a time you limitation. Is that, well, some people registered on the day uh, the during the election okay. primary and voted well, that, that day. I was just was asking, was that a factor yeah. and why it was? They mm -hmm. just have to be 18 be by the election. Mm -hmm. Just as long as you're 18 by the election day okay. or the voting well, day. Madam Chair, is this not something that Dr. Mason could change the verbiage in right now? We've done that before. Board Where's our attorney? I'm right here. You could do it. Well, a few things I was going to say. The first is I have boards that do it both ways. Some boards, quote unquote, approve the first reading with the understanding that the policy is not enacted until it's been approved after twice, basically, on the first reading and on the second reading. It's not required. I have some boards where the first reading is just informational and you don't actually vote to approve the policy until the second reading. Um, so just going back to kind of that issue. And then you can, if everybody wants the language amended, you can vote to approve the policy with that amendment. And we can go back and change it. If, but the language has to be specific so we know what you want to put in there. Well, okay. Would that satisfy you? Would that concern, satisfy Mr. everybody President? if we did it that way? Sure, whatever. So that I we don't have to bring policy. it back? I yeah, would like to see the policies not be included in consent agenda. I'm sorry? I said I would prefer the policies need not be a part of a consent agenda. Well, there was just a couple of things that I think because that we've never I think the in the past we've never so. done it as a, as a consent item. But we've always much. brought them up for discussion. Yeah. Well, I don't think because there might be some issues in that policy. Okay. Well, we I, can I pull whatever we need to pull. So. Yeah. We took a chance, and evidently it did not go over well, uh, <laughs> to put it in a first reading and put it in the consent account calendar for a vote, or agenda for a vote. So um, we will take heed to the comment that was made. Um, but if we could do this so that we could end this tonight, I would truly appreciate it as the chairperson. Would you prefer me to pull my motion to approve it as a first reading and restate so it can yes. be amended? Yes, that's what I would like. I am. S okay. Uh, Mr. Flowers, were you the second on that one? I was. Program? I pulled my second. Okay. Let's see if I can gather my brain on this one. I would like to make a motion that we approve. I've lost which one it is. Item, is it K? K. K. Uh, with the corrections to state that that is the Board of Elections, mm -hmm. not just simply board, as well as uh, volunteers approved by the Board of Elections. I second. <coughs> Let's vote. All right, we have a first and a second. And it says, assisting students in the completion of the forms may only be done by the Board of Election employees or volunteers approved by the Board of Election to do so. All in favor, show by raising your right hand. Okay, any opposed? All right, one opposed. All right, what are we down to now? That was K. So we're down to R. R. I'd like to make a motion that we approve R. 79.20. Yes. Okay, I ask for that to be pulled. Uh, if you will look at uh, under item C, 79 on page 7, or policy code 79.20B. Um, item C is the criteria um, for primary consideration and reduction of force. It lists uh, seven different uh, items there, but if you'll notice the area that has been scratched out that is on 7920B, um, it, it, it adds a statement, the superintendent shall develop a system for using the above mentioned factors to determine which employees will be recommended to the board for inclusion in the reduction in force. Um, I got to thinking about that, and uh, you kind of already have the guidelines up there by which you would make that decision, but then I got to thinking about what about programs? If we're going to cut a program out or that type of thing, what would be the, the, the system that the superintendent would develop and the board not approve one way or the other for 
exclusion. Uh, I know in the past when we have discontinued doing some types of programs because they were not effective anymore or whatever, super, the, the board made that decision. My question in the way this is worded is it says it doesn't tell what the system is that the super just said, superintendent does, it just says that he'll develop a system uh, using those factors above, but it doesn't necessarily say that it's for uh, board approval. And I just think in some certain circumstances, those decisions may need board approval. And I mean, uh, I, Dr. Dunsmore, I mean, was this a suggestion of you or the committee or, or the policy <coughs> committee or what, what was, I want to know what the reasoning behind that being struck and why this was put in and then how does that work when this is put in? Basically that was struck because it came down from the uh, school board association is pulled out. Um, and I think the reason that I, my understanding was, and Rachel, you can jump in any time, was that every school system had different factors that they were weighing of what the different situation is. Number one, whatever, if we have to get to a point of a reduction in force, whatever we used as criteria, in my mind, would have to come back to the board for approval before we did anything anyhow. Well, and that's what it says in D. No, no. Well, it I mean, says so. It, and I think that's a very good example you gave because if it's a program that is licensure specific that we're doing away with, I would obviously change the criteria to match. Well, it says that it says the board would be recommended. Yeah. yeah so, I, I mean, anything that I would do in that, and I've been through these in the past, it comes back to the board if this is our criteria, and the board approves the criteria, and then we move forward. Well, it says recommended to the board. Right. So you but make I, a recommendation my, to the board. My key is on develop a system for using the above mentioned factors. Right. And that could be any number of things. So, for example, these are the factors that are going to be considered, but how are they going to be considered? Are they going to be, is, are you going to use a point system to try to determine, but what's the system that's going to be used to show or how those factors are considered? So the factors are laid out, but the superintendent's going to develop a system for how he's going to use those factors to determine which employees he's going to recommend for, for a RIF. So he's, you know ahead of time what system he's using. You know what factors already, right. but you're going to know ahead of time what is the system it, of his application of those factors. Well, is it going to be consistent across the board, though, too? Well, that, yeah. that's why you want a system for applying the factors. So here are all the factors that we agree are the factors for consideration. Here's the system that we're going to use for applying those factors, the superintendent's going to use, for making a recommendation for a RIF. That way, when you get a recommendation, you know what system has been used to apply those factors. It, it does impart the idea or the theory behind it is it does impart a level of fairness because it's not we use the factors this way when we're making this recommendation. We use the factors this way when we're making this recommendation. The system for, for utilizing the factors by the superintendent for recommendations is set ahead of time in hopes that that means that it's more fairly applied. I just, I, I, I just looked at it and the more I thought about it, I said this could easily be a double standard on, on something, but that's, I mean, if it's, it's okay with the rest of the board, I'd go with it. But, uh, there's no, no offense on you, Dr. Dunsmore, because I figured this probably did come down from the School Board Association, right, but no it, just, to me. it just leaves, <laughs> it, it leaves the, it, you know, you can go through that right door, you can go through that left door, you know, and, and that's what I'm looking at here. Um, I, I, just, I just felt like um, it would be nice if we knew what that system was, but I, I guess you could put a line in that. In the first place, you look to be board members. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No well, yeah. Tell me which store to go out and I'll go out. All right. <laughs> Are we ready for the vote? Ready for All that. in favor of approving policy 7920, indicate by raising your right hand. Any opposed in the same manner? Motion carried. I'd like to make a motion, Madam Hold Chair. Hold on one second. Madam Chair, may I ask the board to revisit um, the policy you talked about a moment ago, policy 5130? I have our um, file on that, and I didn't write that revision, but I did bring the file with me on it. And in pulling the file and looking at the statute, 
the board they're talking about is the board of education okay so, we'll see that i got a problem with. so the statute what the statute says is um i was going to read it for you <laughs> a local board of education may but is not required to designate high school employees to assist in completing the forms only employees who volunteer for this duty may be designated by boards of education so what it's saying is the Board of Education can allow volunteers to help with the completion of the form. You can't force anybody to, be, to help with the completion of the form. So my question then is could those, could those volunteers come from the Board of Elections? It says that we can designate high school employees to assist in completing the So they have the to be high school employees. But that doesn't say they can't be Board of Election people. It just says we can select no it says you are you may but you're not required to designate high school employees so you're allowed to designate high school employees but you don't have to there's nothing that says that you're allowed to designate board of election employees was there anything that says we can't that was my question yes, no but i would say where where it us. specifically <laughs> gives you the authority to and also it would be hard for you to designate board of election employees because you don't have any authority over them It'll be more of an allow versus designate. So keeping the the um, policy language in line with the statute, the policy language mirror that you have before you were questioning is exactly what's in the statute. But any clarification on the board who can provide employees but can't force anybody to help with the completion is the Board of Education. But my question, my question there is, um, and I think that's the elephant in the room that nobody's really speaking to is the um, the impartiality that is absolutely necessary when you start talking about voter registration um, it is it is uh, the board of elections uh, that's their task that's their that's their that's their um, responsibility and there are there are uh, rules and regulations in place for them to operate in an impartial manner, mm -hmm. but yeah, we don't wrong. we don't have those same right requirements. As we school. addressed that I in think, the meeting. Yeah, we we did. This came up uh, for discussion because I asked the question about using um, because there had been some changes made since I was a principal, so I wanted to find out what they were and why. When I was um, a principal at a high school, the Board of Elections approved volunteers to come in and work with our students on this registration process. Okay, and you wouldn't just have one person, you would have three or four different people because you don't want to be persuaded in any, in any one direction. <coughs> so then it changed that a teacher at the school, and that teacher may have volunteered, so I'm not saying that the teacher was forced to do it, but that the, the Board of Elections kind of somewhat stepped back and then a teacher at the school became responsible for getting this information to students and assisting them in the registration process. Mm -hmm. And so, personally, I have a concern about a teacher being assigned or even volunteering because it's one person. It's not a group of people to validate what is going on in that process. So that's why we were trying to involve the Board of Elections. So if, if we cannot do that, I mean, but that is why we were trying to do it. Yeah, I understand. And that's why yeah, we, we were most. looking at board as being the Board of Election and not the Board of Education. I have a question. <clears throat> if, it, if this is a general statute, mm -hmm. then what choice do we have a lot tonight? Of Right. Okay. We have a lot in this one. I would actually propose that we just strike the entire assisting students in the completion of this form as may only be done by board employees to do so. I'll say. Because we don't need it. I'll let me, say. Let me say that. Was that a motion? Things well, you could say in there would be, it, it, you could say something along the lines, other alternative language might be, for example, assisting students in the completion of the forms may only be done by board employees who volunteer to do so. No, no, no. So the point, the point of the language is focused on not forcing any board employee 
to have the to be delegated the responsibility of assisting with filling out. Correct, but I think the concern mm -hmm. coming from the board is, is the any specific mm -hmm. um, lean towards a one party or another. So well, yeah, we can right. just eliminate that entire line because we're not required to have anyone do it. Is that accurate? Based You're on not required. It says you may. Okay. So are we yeah. saying then that we're not going to provide voter uh, oh, no, we provide, for voter registration? We provide the um, re voter registration forms. We just strike after that little blue part, assisting students yeah. in the completion of the forms. Because everything else stays. The principal or designee of each high school can make the, or shall make them available, or they can be found at this website. May, may I suggest you pull it and send it back to policy? The only thing that I... Th from a legal standpoint, the only thing that I'm concerned about mm -hmm. is that I think it's important for the board to specify in policy for your administrators to understand they cannot delegate to anybody, designate anybody, the responsibility of helping to fill out with those forms. So I'm looking at it, I understand the concern about impartiality from a legal standpoint. I want to make sure so that your board policy language. specifically tells your administrators so that they know we are not allowed i can't the the principal who may not be thinking about it in the way we're thinking about it right now we don't want that person saying okay you go help these kids fill out that form and that person never volunteered and now they're in violate the principal's in violation of the statute mm -hmm. so, I, did, I just think we're walking on a fine line just because i'm gonna give you an example my children when they when they registered to vote and they got old enough to register to vote their question was, Daddy, how should I register? Right. Should I register to be a Democrat or should I register to be a Republican? Well, I sat down and I told them both about the two different parties and I also told them about unaffiliated. I said, this has got to be your decision. And actually, I had one of them vote, registered differently from how I was, my party affiliation. But I gave them that opportunity to do what they wanted to do. Now, that being said, I don't know that somebody would do the same thing with them and do it in a more, uh, I guess you would say, aggressive way and say, I think you ought to register this. This is what I am. I think you ought to do that. You know, I think we're putting ourselves in a situation where I, I, I don't question the Board of Elections coming in and, and sending representatives to do that because I feel like they'll be fair and impartial. But I'm not so sure that, that certain people would not be fair and impartial in mm -hmm. trying to assist a student in registering for to vote. Then the other thing was is the way the language was, it could have been led to lead led to believe that it would have to be people around this table telling them how to do that. And I think an elected official should be the last one to tell them how to I agree. how to I'd like to make a motion that we send policy 5130 back to the policy committee um, for further review. I second that. All right. Any discussion? Yes, I, I do have a question uh, for the attorney um, regarding this. Is there anything in the statute that would preclude us from um, requesting the Board of Elections provide training to any volunteers? Nope. I think that the training would be completely up to you. The focus of the language really was, I understand how you're looking at it, and I understand the concern completely. I, the, the focus was, nobody should be made to do it. And I do agree. I agree with that. Part. And I want you to understand, I'm not opposed. I, I think everybody turns 18. I think every citizen has a right to vote, and I think they ought to register to vote. Um, but I'm, I'm not a, I'm kind of opposed to us getting our feet involved in the middle of that process. I don't think it's in the scope of the Board of Education. But All right. anyway, Any more I voted against it the first time. Any more discussion? <laughs> <laughs> well, we voted on it already. Do I we have need to put it back up for a vote. We need to unvote on it. That's well, what she, we she just did. did. She's, oh, made okay. another, she's made another motion to send it back to policy. Okay. All right. Now I'll second. Okay, so we have a first and a second on the motion to send policy 51 5130 back to the policy committee for review. Um, any discussion? I'm going to do like Mr. Flowers. I'm on 30. Uh, <laughs> okay. In that case, <laughs> all in favor indicate by raising your right hand. Those opposed? Okay. Madam Chair. 
Can we make it through the last one? I'd like to make a motion that we approve item S, policy 8300. Okay, Madam Chair, I wanted to ask for that to be report, uh, pulled. Uh, and in specific... Uh, Hold on a second, do you have a second? Can I have a second first? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Do I have a second? I'll give you a second just for discussion. Just for discussion. Okay. All right. Um, item number four. Yes. Uh, it says no monies will be expended regardless of the source, including the monies derived from federal, state, local, or private sources, except in accordance with the board's budget resolution or amendments to the budget resolution. The superintendent is authorized to transfer monies from one appropriation to another within the same fund subject to such limitations and procedures as may be prescribed by the board resolution or state or federal laws or regulation. Any such transfers must be reported to the board at its next regular meeting and recorded in the minutes. Now, let me back out of that and go to my notes, okay? Give me just a second. I had a couple of questions about that. Um, where it's talking about uh, the superintendent shall and so my question is is what are the limitations of that practice um, and and this is something that maybe Dr. Dunsmore can answer for me um, because I'm not quite sure what the authority is by finance by you to be able to move funds you know from one place to the other my my question is and i'll give you an example like title one or state designated funds where they are designated for, they have to be used in a certain area um does that fall under the, like the auspices of the board where uh if you make a decision to transfer five over five thousand dollars that we need to be involved in it and do we need to be involved in it prior to it already being done because this is saying that it needs to be reported to the board at the next, next meeting because we move money within budget codes regularly that's what you get those budget amendments each month right and i know we get the budget and amendments if but it's at a five thousand dollar limit we're going to have a board meeting probably every week the five thousand dollar limit was for expenditures yeah. right expenditures but uh, my question is is in, in moving and transferring the money um does i mean does that my question would be are do you have the authority to move it like in title one when it's designated it's got to be used for let me give you an example <laughs> i use this example all the time you ride down the highway and you hit potholes all the time but the federal money pays for flowers to be planted on the side of the road and the potholes can't be filled okay mm -hmm. And I mean, that's a known fact. We all have experienced that. It's torn our cars up while we looked at the pretty flowers. My question is, is um, when you have federal designated monies like that, are you allowed to move it from fund to fund to do the jobs that you feel like need to be done? Do you have that no, flexibility? It says, no, it said it has to be okay. used within the budget code to choose and I go to jail. Okay. So we, we don't transfer money between federal Okay, so in what you can do, are there any, uh, in, the, in the area, in the realm of what you can do, are there any limitations to that practice? When you say you can do it within the same budget code. Let, let me just go ahead and say that there is a, the general statute 115C 433 provides authority for the stu superintendent to have the authority to transfer within the same fund it's just that the board has to adopt a resolution that says it we we treat including that in a policy saying that they can do it as your resolution so it's basically the uh, the superintendent has statutory authority to move it but the board has to okay that authority we do that by including a statement in your policy that says 
this is basically this is our resolution that allows the superintendent to move to transfer funds with transfer monies within a fund. Okay, but there's no limitations on the amount of money that can be transferred. That's what I'm asking. I, I don't know about any limitation on an amount, a specific amount of money that can be transferred within the fund. But what that's why the resolution is written within state or as long as it's compliant with state or federal law. Because one of the things we try to do in our policy writing is if it was an amount, we wouldn't put the amount in here. Because if they meet next year and raise it by $50 or $1,000, then you have to meet again. So we treat it broadly enough to say if it's legal and he can do, if there's not a, a legal prohibition on the transfer of the funds within the fund, then the board is saying if it's legal for him to move that money and he feels like he needs to move the money, then he can move the money within the fund. We're okay with that. That's essentially what you're saying here. Mm -hmm. Nothing about what you would have here would allow him to do something that wasn't already legal. For him to do. Well, Does that we, make sense? As I understand it, we uh, I take our small capital outlay funds. The entire amount has to be budgeted out. We ask mm -hmm. ask the money from the county. The entire two million dollars is budgeted out for items. But all during the year, things fall mm -hmm. out of the sky. Like so last year, the the big purchase was a chiller that fell out. You know, an expense. So yeah. those funds would end that account were moved around. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's basically what we do now. This is just uh, ensuring that. I, I read this too, Mr. Pridgen, and I went back through it and I said, well, you know, as um, long as he's not taking money out of child nutrition and putting it over in facilities. Yeah. <laughs> All right, are we he's ready for the vote? Yes. All right. All in favor of approving. Uh, policy 8300, physical management standards, second reading. Uh, indicate by raising your right hand. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. And all others have been approved. And our prior vote. Okay, now we are at board members and superintendent comments. Hold on one second. Oh. I just want to make sure. So we pulled these. Three. I, I want to go back and make sure I need to look at my notes. But we pulled 8,300, 7920, and 5130. And I just want to ensure that we have we voted that you voted on all of the other policies that have been presented. Yes, we did okay. that first, and right. we pulled these out, and then we voted on each one of these. And 5130 is the only one going back. Yeah, it's going back. We changed the look. Okay. All right. Any comments starting with our board uh, attorney? No, ma'am. All right, Mr. West. Uh, Mr. Burton, I'd just like to say, and she just got up and left probably 10 minutes, five minutes ago, but Phyllis Moore has been assigned back to cover our board meetings. Oh, has she? Yes, she has. And she's, she's always been very fair and consistent, and she's done an excellent job. I'm glad to see her back. Yes. I think she, she, does, she does well for the school system. And the other thing, Miss Burden, I was going to invite everybody in the room if y'all would like to sing happy birthday to Miss Burden. This happy is her birthday. birthday. But if you don't, then we'll just acknowledge that and say happy birthday, Miss Burden. You going to lead us? Well, I can. <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Miss Burden. Happy birthday to you. I am very happy to tell you that I am 71 years old today, and God has truly blessed me, and I appreciate it, and I want him to continue to bless me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank all of you. I appreciate it. Those are my comments, ma'am. Ah, thank you. You did an excellent job. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Flowers? Well, I marked that one off, but... Anyway, I was in the amen corner on your work. <laughs> um, in light of tonight's um, uh, agenda, I would like to recommend, or in my opinion, we need to take uh, contract approvals and policies out of the consent agenda moving forward and put them back up under board actions, which is where they were at one time. 
so that we can properly vet them without going through a complicated process being in the consent agenda. But that's my opinion. Um, the other thing is Mr. Dean Sauls is going to be retiring. I want to wish him well. Uh, I think you have a little gathering tomorrow or the next day or is our last week. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I had it. I had it on my agenda, but I got a better offer and I couldn't make it. But it wasn't because I don't wish you well. I do, and I've I've enjoyed uh, working with you, Dean. Um, I told, I figure you'll probably get you a job at University of Mount Olive now teaching history, local history or something like that. You'd certainly be good at it. But anyway, I wish you well, Dean. Thank you for all you've done to try to help us. And lastly, I want to wish everyone uh, a happy 4th of July. That's right. That's right. Those are my comments. All right, thank you. Mr. Henderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I would like to thank you personally for allowing me the opportunity again to introduce to the community uh, Mr. B.J. Lark and the outstanding job that he is doing. Uh, I am extremely proud of him and what he is trying to accomplish. And um, I wish him well on that endeavor, and I hope that many of us will uh, be willing to contribute to his GoFundMe page. And if you don't do GoFundMe, just send him a little check or something that will be helpful to him. Um, second of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Reynolds for that excellent presentation on advanced ed that tonight. Uh, it was very informative and I, I hope that we will take to heart many of the things that she has said uh, relative to what we might need to do. I want to compliment uh, Dr. Tim Harrow on, on his uh, coming in and taking charge of the facilities and recognizing the good and outstanding work that Mr. Sauls has done and I hope that he will continue the efforts that in that respect. And lastly, I would like to say uh, congratulations to you, Mr. Sauls, um, for those numerous years of uh, experience and expertise in education in Wayne County. I wish you the best. Mr. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam <laughs> Chair. Um, I'd, I'd like to, first of all, um, thank Marsha Manning for the job that she's done at Goldsboro High School. Um, she was willing to step up the bat and jump in with both feet and play dual roles. And I certainly do appreciate everything that you've done uh, to help us out. Uh, you came on board and you were you were thrown into a lot of things and I really do appreciate what you've done and the hard work you've done and I really feel like you've made a good impact on a lot of the students there and I appreciate your your leadership um, and uh, look forward to seeing probably more of you back here at the central office too so anyway um, Dean Sauls uh, Man, I could sit and talk for hours about you. I know you started to work with us when Rosewood Middle School was being constructed. But um, anyway, <laughs> we're, uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we really do appreciate, we really do, we really do, we do really appreciate all the years of service that you have given to this school system and the influence that not not just that you've made on the teachers and I mean and the, the, the faculty and everybody the, the impression you've made on students over the years um, I, I looked at that quilt that was at your uh, party last week uh, that had been made and I went wow what what a uh, what a tribute to a person who has um, been so dedicated in, in athletics and and everything that you've done I mean and uh, I really do appreciate that, and I know, uh, I know uh, we're going to probably at some point have to tear Rosewood Middle down. But um, anyway, <laughs> since you're gone now, no, I'm just messing with you. But um, thank you so much. You've done a great job, Dean, and and uh, I can't say enough for what you have done for this school system. And um, and uh, don't don't just disappear. We'd love to see you around some more. Yeah, we really would. Um, Carver alumni, um, yeah, I think we'll be in touch and, and be telling them how we, they can help. I know 
Um, I've worked with several organizations over the years since I've been on the board mentoring kids, and I know that there's a lot of children out there that probably need to be mentored. Uh, there's a lot of children out there that need help. Tonight we voted on a lot of people coming in for the summer reading program to, um, to help children and to help get them where they need to be. But uh, long-term re lasting relationships, not just the summer, is very important, especially for key groups that are willing to come in and help us and, and work with children. And I hope that they may consider to do that. And um, I'm gonna try my best to make one of their um, uh, functions that they have upcoming. I thought the, the history of Carver would probably be very interesting uh, on October the 13th, but I, have not, I haven't checked my schedule to see when or what or if, uh, I can, can make that. Um, BJ, wow, Brogdon Primary School, raising funds. Um, great article in the paper. It really, it really was, it was a great article in the paper and I'm so glad that I got the opportunity to meet him tonight and I do wanna make a contribution. Um, it, it's amazing how one person can make a difference in their school and it's amazing how one child is making a difference in the school and having the desire to go out and help other schools. Um, it, it, it's just, uh, he put one foot in front of the other and he is really, it's just ballooned and blossomed and I just think it's such a, a, a wonderful thing. He, uh, uh, kudos to him, I mean, it's great and that's, uh, I, I got to congratulate his parents because that's evident that he has been, had great parenting skills and his mom and dad should be very proud of the job that they have done with him. Um, Margaret Bedour came to us tonight and um, that was a very generous gift to Goldsboro High School. Um, I've been on that stage many a time and, uh, and it's, uh, it's a great thing for us to have a good sound system in that, in that auditorium now at this time because it's, it's kind of difficult when you go to concerts and you're sitting about halfway from the stage and you can't hear uh, what's going on. Uh, but I really do appreciate the people and the community players that jumped in and helped her with that project. I think that's great. It's another great example of something that just a few people can do for our school system if they want to take, uh, take that under our wing or under their wing. And then the last comment that I would like to say is there has not been a single board meeting that I have sat in this particular chair that when I turn around to do the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, I think that nobody out there can see the flag because I'm standing in front of it. <laughs> and I apologize for that. <laughs> and uh, if, I, if, if I'm reelected, maybe I get in a different chair. So then maybe somebody, <laughs> I started in that seat, so you know, if I'm reelected, maybe I get that seat back or something, so I'll be out of the way so people can see the flag. Um, it's kind of tough when you're looking at somebody's back and you're saying something, but anyway, that's all the comments that I have. Have a great summer. Um, you know, thank you, teachers, for all the job that you've done this year, and and I hope uh, hope everybody has a good vacation, a good break, and happy birthday to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Mrs. Strickland. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was going to start by saying Mr. Pridgen stole half of what I had to say until he got to the end, and that was not something I had intended to say <laughs> at all. Um, I do want to apologize for not being at the last meeting. The Sunday before the last meeting, I started running a fever. So on Monday, I went to the doctor, and I had the flu in May, followed by bronchitis, followed by food poisoning. So I have been absent, and I am sorry for that. Um, and the reason that I even mention that is because I do want to thank Mr. Sean Hicks for coming and speaking today um, about the drop-off time of the elementary schools being so late. Um, I know Mr. Henderson voiced uh, concern about that at the last meeting, and I would have as well. Um, I would love if we could really just, re I know we won't, but I would love if we could revisit those times on those elementary schools. It, I'm not leaving my small children at home for a school bus. Middle schoolers, high schoolers, sure. Um, but I'm suspicious that it has something to do with our lack of lighting at some of our ball fields for the middle schools that the decision was made. And it bothers me that we may be putting the needs of a couple of dozen ball players over the needs of hundreds of elementary students. 
and their parents. Um, so thank you, Mr. Hicks, for coming. I know he stayed a long time and, and finally left. Um, I, of course, I wanted to say thank you to Ms. Bedore and the sound system. That is huge. I have said for the three years I've been up here, just pick something that you're passionate about, step up and do it. And, and that's something that she and her family are passionate about and they're helping and I greatly appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Merrill, thank you for speaking about the Southern Wayne Gym. Uh, that is something that Mr. Henderson and myself as well as uh, Dr. Dunsmore have met with uh, Mr. Ed Cromarty and Joe Daugherty. This is going forward. They're going to get the gym. They're not going to be missed anymore. You've got the right people in place. It's going to happen. It's going out for bid. Mr. Harrell's taking care of that and we're very excited about it. Um, I also uh, want to say that I'm glad to see the tennis courts are going to be fixed soon at Rosewood High School and at CBA Cock because it is really sad when you go out there and see the shape that a lot of our facilities are in, but I have full confidence in Mr. Harold that we're going to have things on a agenda rotation and start getting things fixed. Um, and we'll leave that at that. Mr. Sauls, I'm going to miss you. You got to come back up here so I can harass you. Every heartbeat full. That's exactly right for the purple and gold. <laughs> and those are my comments. Thank you, Mrs. Smith. Okay. Um, start out by saying happy birthday again, Ms. Burton. Thank you. All right. And um, Mr. Sauls, we've we've uh, we've had our we've had our times together, and they've always been good and always been positive. And I wish you nothing but the best. I really do. Uh, to the leadership team, thank you for what you do. Excellent presentations. I know you guys work hard all the time, and I know we, we don't make it easy for you, but I do appreciate what you bring to the table. Uh, Mr. Merrill, thank you for your comments as well. Um, the presentation by Dr. Reynolds um, kind of stood out to me because I made a couple of notes. One of the things that um, I have, I'm adamant about is that there's too much testing in our school system. Um, and a lot of these tests are just absolutely unnecessary. Um, I've done, you know, some, some reading in my day, Mr. Flowers, and the reading and the study that I've done and the research that I've done um, clearly states that testing in and of itself does not make the student a, a better student. It may. Edu learning makes them a better student, okay? and. When you start talking about taking snapshots, and I think Mr. Pridgen brought this up about the 1.6 uh, usage of technology, and that's only at that time, it's the same thing with the EOG test. The EOG test only measures what's happening that day and where that student is at that moment. It doesn't speak to where that student came from, you know, as far as where their starting point to where they are that day. And so I'm, I'm definitely uh, in, in favor of um, reducing the amount of testing. I understand there's legislation right now that's being uh, considered by the uh, General Assembly about doing that very thing. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful that they'll do that. Uh, the Carver alumni event that's coming up, I will be uh, speaking to their scholarship uh, banquet, their scholarship program. And, I'm probably going to give Ms. Burton a call to get some pointers because she's she's scholarship chairperson for the Dillard Coast Pro alumni. So I'll I'll probably call her to get some points to talk about. So you know, looking forward to that. Um, and the something that Mr. Henderson said in, um, during the meeting that I, that I thought was very profound: <clears throat> low performing schools. That snapshot is not an indicator of whether or not learning is going on inside that building. I, I, I really appreciate you saying that, Mr. Henson, because that, you know, this ABC thing that we do is, uh, is really, in a lot of ways, unfair. Because you're saying that everybody in that school is an F, and that's not true. You know, everybody in that school is a D, that's not true. So I, I just think that those things need bear, bear mentioning. The, um, Donation for Goldsboro High School by Ms. Bedore, that was absolutely wonderful. And um, Ms. Manning, you, you and your staff are to be commended for what you've had to work with all year as far as facilities and things of that nature. I know we went to several events and there were wasps flying around in there. So hopefully they're all gone because I don't like getting stung. Um, but uh, 
it is definitely uh, good to see that. Um, and the young man, B.J. Law, off the chain, off the chain. And it is amazing how one person can make a difference, not only in his school, but in his community. He's got people coming together um, that did not necessarily have um, similar uh, points of view. But on this particular point of view, I think everybody can rally around that. That is, that is absolutely uh, uh, amazing. And the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, this resolution that we were asked to vote on tonight at the last minute, and I hesitated mainly because, like you said, I hadn't read the bill itself, but we were asked to vote on a resolution in support of something we hadn't read. And, and, I, and, I, and I did look at some things while I was sitting here, so since it was brought to the table, I will speak to it. Um, the Senate Bill 711 is definitely in favor of agriculture and the um, for the state of North Carolina, but there was some concern um, by the governor uh, as it relates to one part of that bill, and the governor actually vetoed that bill because of that concern, and that concern was that it limits the amount of um, compensation that a neighbor who lives next to a hog farm, and that hog farm causes damage to their land, it limits how much they can uh, receive in comp compensation. So there, there was, you know, it wasn't completely unanimous as far as support for it, but I, I do understand that the bill in its totality is definitely something um, that is um, in, in the best interest of our agricultural uh, programs for the state of North Carolina, but I did want everybody to know that, that there was some concern about that bill that uh, that was brought forward so I just hope that we don't get we don't get put in that situation in the future as to vote on something that we know nothing about okay that's my those are my comments all right Dr. Johnson um, I'll try to be short and sweet happy birthday thank you hopefully <laughs> many more uh, Mr. Saul as you know how I feel about you congratulations um, I know you'll be around and congratulations on your last board meeting that's all I have <laughs> well, I've had six people, seven people speak, and they have covered uh, everything that has occurred tonight. Uh, I do appreciate the presentations that were made and the manner in which they were made and the information that we re received. And um, of course, I applaud the young man. Uh, it says a lot about him as an individual and what he thinks of his teachers and the staff and the students as, at that school. And the community that is supporting him lets them know how they feel about him as an individual. And so I do encourage everyone to consider um, making a donation, a contribution, because this is something that is coming back to Wayne County. And um, he's willing to share the funds. And the fact that he's been so eager that when he's reached his goals, he's been willing to go a step <laughs> further and a step further. So let's help him um, accomplish that goal so that maybe it will set an example for others to do for their school. So, and the parents are just outstanding. And I know they must be very, very, very proud. They two have two handsome sons. And um, the oldest one is setting a very good example for the young one. Uh, I thank you very much for your uh, recognition of my birthday. Someone said, um, why are you having board meetings on your birthday? Well, yesterday we were in appeal hearings from 8 to 4. And if I had picked Tuesday, two people would have killed me immediately. So... <laughs> Wednesday was the best day, wasn't it, Dr. Dunsmore? Absolutely. So I, uh, I, I don't feel that I've had a bad birthday now because I've had a, a, a lot of treats and all good things throughout the day. So I really appreciate you doing that. I hope you have a wonderful 4th of July, and those of you that will be taking vacations this summer, be safe. Now, Mr. Sauls. You see, we used to have a little story about driving Miss Daisy. Mr. Sauls was the driver, and I was Miss Daisy. And we traveled, and we traveled to uh, many athletic events across the state of North Carolina. And while we were traveling, I learned things about ne North Carolina that I never <laughs> knew that I did not know about North Carolina. And uh, 
we are going to miss, miss you, but we appreciate all that you have done for Wayne County. And as someone, uh, some board, as one of the board members said, it's not just the staff that you work with or the administrators that you have served, but it is the impact that you've made on the lives of students who have come in contact with you. And that is, that is the best. Thank you. Yes, they were. Motion to adjourn. All right, Mr. Henderson, who has done the most talking tonight. All right, all in favor? I need a motion to adjourn. Okay, all in favor? I did. Raise your right hand. Good night.